Welcome everybody to the Home Energy Audit webinar co-presented by SmartNet Alliance and the City of Ottawa. And tonight we will hear from three expert energy advisors and they will introduce what an audit is, what to expect on the day of your audit and what next steps you'll be able to take after. For those of you who don't know me, I am Nick Hebb with SmartNet Alliance. The Alliance is a group of businesses and organizations who are collaborating on projects and initiatives to accelerate the transition to Canada's sustainable economy. For more information on SNA, please consult our website and I'll share that into chat shortly. Uh, many of, and many of our members were working in the home retrofit space. So make sure to check out our new relaunched members pages, which have video, PDF resources, a section for an overview services, embedded map, and a whole lot of other features. So be sure to check that out. I will put uh, those links shortly into chat. So as I was saying earlier, just to give everybody a bit of a rundown for whoever's jumped on the call recently, uh, we're going to hear from Janice from the City of Ottawa briefly about the Energy Evolution Program. Then we're going to roll over to Marcus Hins, Scott Mayer, and Stephen Magneron for our Stephen Magneron for our uh, for our presentations tonight. So uh, please add your questions into chat, and I will get them over to our presenters. We'll have a bit of time after each presentation, and uh, after following the presentations, we'll hear from a few of our uh, smart and Alliance members who are working in the uh, home retrofit space. And then uh, time pending, we'll, uh, we'll open it up for some follow-up questions. So if people have follow-up questions, uh, you can raise your hand with a reaction there on Zoom and I can unmute you so you can answer your question. And that'll be generally after eight o'clock. Okay, so I have put everybody on mute. So just to let you know, so do, do put your questions into chat. So thanks so much, everybody, for, for coming in. We're, we're close to 200 people, so it's great to see all the interest and activity around home energy audits. I know it's something that uh, we're pushing at SmartNet Alliance, and I'm happy to say that the uh, NRCAN grant was announced today. So uh, there'll be a ton of people who can line up for that new grant, which is a $5,000 grant, and it will be a precursor to that. We'll be having a home energy audit. There's also a few other uh, federal programs and the City Better Home Loans program, which we're going to hear about tonight. So first up, uh, let's welcome Marcus Hins. And Marcus is a certified energy manager with over 10 years experience in energy optimization and energy auditing. Marcus has garnered consulting experience in Canada through working with buildings to reduce their energy consumption. During his tenure, he's carried out research on efficient building products and materials, and most importantly, methods of automation and control. Marcus is currently managing a portfolio of commercial buildings in Southern Ontario area as an energy manager. He also runs a firm specializing in project management, energy research, sustainability, geomatics, and slash GIS called Enerscope Energy. So thanks for joining us, Marcus. Come on in, unmute, share your screen, and get rolling for a bit of an introduction on energy audits. Okay, thank you, Nick, and good evening, everyone. Hopefully everyone is able to hear me. Uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, and hopefully you'll be able to see that. So let's see here. I'm sharing my screen, and I'm hoping that everyone is able to see that. Now, as Nick said, thank you for having me this evening. And I want to speak a little bit about energy auditing with you this evening. And I want to go into a number of things, a number of different things that you might hear floating around the presentation today and the industry in general. So I first want to talk a little bit about an overview. You know, you might have heard the federal grants have been released. You're hearing different changes to different programs and things like that. I just want to talk about where that's coming from in the overview. So we'll be able to understand by the time I finish the overview why that's come about, you know, where it's coming about, where it's going in the next couple of years and things like that. Now, after that, I want to talk a little bit about some technical terminology that you may hear. Some of it may be familiar to you. Some of it may not be. Nick might have mentioned uh, GigaJoule, might have mentioned a blower door test, things like that. Uh, we'll definitely dive into what those terms mean, where they came from, and we'll be able to understand those when I'm finished with that as well. Now, I don't want to encroach on Scott's territory here, but I will talk a little bit about uh, blower door testing. I'll talk about the process, the entire audit process, what to expect, uh, things like the cost, the value of having an audit done on your home, uh, essentially the entire process 
at a general level. And then we'll have some Q&A just before we wrap it up and pass it over to Scott. So those are just some of the things that I wanted to go over with you. And most importantly, like I said, uh, is the overview to understand where all of this would have been coming from. So I'm going to go ahead and advance and that will take us into our presentation for today. Now, if you look at the right side of my screen here, you'll actually realize that uh, we have a goal of 2050. And that's just because the Canadian government looked at all of Canada. And from here on, we're going to refer to all of Canada as the pan-Canadian framework. That's like the, the technical term for all of Canada. And in looking at that framework, they realize that essentially, you know, we're a little bit above what our greenhouse gases should be. And if we were ranked in the world, we essentially came in about 11th out of all the countries in the world in terms of greenhouse gases, and per capita, we came in about fifth, and that's not a good place to be. So essentially, the federal government said, you know what, we need to do something about this, we need to understand this problem, and we need to tackle this because climate change is a real challenge that we're facing here in Canada. Now, out of that came the Climate Action Plan, and there were a number of things that were focused on or a number of strategies that were looked at in the climate action plan. One of them was clean growth of the economy and trying to achieve net zero status for the pan-Canadian framework by 2050. Uh, another thing was engaging energy experts as well. And another one was putting a, an actual monetary value of price on pollution and trying to use that price to address climate change. So that's why you would have seen things like the Ontario Cap and Trade Program coming about. Uh, you might have heard the announcement where the government is looking for 2,000 new energy auditors in the next, I think it's two, three years. Uh, you might have heard of some grants and new grants floating around, things like that. That's essentially where all of this is coming from. It's coming from that goal to be net zero by 2050. Now on the right side of my screen here, if you look at this graph, and this graph represents various components of your home, if you look at between 2021 and 2050, you'd realize that we have several opportunities to be able to do something about the consumption of each of our homes. Now, there are different parts of your home, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but things like your siding, your insulation, your doors, those all make up what's gonna be called the building envelope, and we'll talk about that in a minute as well. You also have appliances that consume natural gas and then some other appliances like refrigerators that consume electricity. Now, I just wanna clarify here, when we're saying electricity, we mean actual electricity from the grid. And when we're saying energy, we're referring to a mixture of natural gas and electricity. And when we say natural gas, we refer to natural gas only. So there's this little gray area between the two. If your home is using energy, it means that you're using both electricity and natural gas. And that's what the average home does in Canada as well. Now, one thing that happens with the grid is because of the way that it's set up the energy mix, we essentially have to use fossil fuel sometimes in Canada. We have to use fossil fuels sometimes to generate the electricity that we need. So it means that the energy that your home is pulling from the grid is contributing to those fossil fuel uh, greenhouse gas emissions as well. So if we're able to reduce the amount of energy that you use in your home, you're indirectly reducing your uh, fossil fuels emissions, your greenhouse gas emissions, and you're able to curb that in that particular way. Now, this was the federal goal. Uh, the federal strategy and the climate action plan was adopted by all the provinces and then it was adopted by all the regions and essentially it trickled down through the entire framework that way. Now one such manifestation of that, and I'm so excited about this, I cannot tell you how excited I am, uh, is the Better Homes Loan Program. You may see it written or as an acronym, the BHLP, and this is a program that is geared to the city of Ottawa and it is a program where you can take a loan out, but this loan is not attached to you personally. This loan is attached to your property value. And uh, you use that loan to essentially make energy efficient upgrades to your home. Now this program was recently released 
but it came out of a program uh, that was modeled in Toronto. They did a little, it was a product study essentially. Uh, they modeled it, they tested it, they did some feedback. They essentially looked at how it was gonna work. So they did a model on that. And that program from the city of Toronto was called the HELP program, the Home Energy Loan Program. Very simple, very easy to remember. So if you want help, then that's what is going on there. So in that particular case, the Better Homes Loan Program was modeled from the city of Toronto. And like I said, it really does provide uh, funding and support for homeowners to be able to do energy efficient uh, upgrades and retrofits. And of course, that is just because sometimes uh, funding is an issue and it's just the government's way, essentially, uh, you know, the, the province's way and all levels of government just trying to encourage persons to do this thing. Because remember, we have that goal of 2050 net zero to be able to be met, right? So that's what's happening and they're trying to meet that goal. So because of those goals, you will see some city level programs in your city. So check your local websites. Those will definitely be changing in the next coming uh, months. You will see some provincial level uh, funding and support programs. And you'll also see some federal uh, initiatives as well, like the Greener Homes Program is an example of that. Uh, Ontario has the Save on Energy Program. And you'll see some other programs uh, start to take shape as well. Now, at the end of my presentation, I'll talk a little bit more about those. So definitely look out for those as well. Now I wanted to talk about some of the terms that you may hear referred to in our presentation this evening. And this is just my way of saying, don't freak out if you hear these terms, just keep it calm uh, and just refer to what I said here. So if you heard the term building envelope, it's not an actual envelope, this is the exterior walls of your building. But the exterior walls do a number of different functions for your home. Of course, number one is providing structural support. And then number two is stopping the exterior air that's outside when it's cold and icky in January. It's stopping that cold air from getting inside your home, which is nice and warm and cozy. So that's the second function of your building envelope climate and moisture control. It keeps all that climate and moisture outside while it keeps your inside nice and toasty and warm. The third thing that it does is it has a frame, it has a structure, and that structure allows you to put things like drywall, it allows you things like painting, allows you to hang paintings and things like that. It's essentially one of the third uh, uh, functions of your building envelope. So your building envelope is made up of a number of different components all the way from your siding on the outside and exterior of your home, all the way to the interior of your home. And that's very important. And we'll come back to that a little bit later. Now I said I'll talk about a blur door test. And like I said, I just wanted to give you a general overview. And a blur door test is essentially a test that looks at your home and it tries to figure out exactly how much air is leaking in and out of your home. Because that air, remember, you are pumping nice warm air into your home in the winter months. But if that air is getting out, it means that's essentially free air that you're giving away. And I'm sure that we don't want to do that. So air tightness is a term that looks at the air leakage of your home and how that is measured or how that is done is by a blower door test. Now I'll talk about a blower door test in a minute, but the main component, the main result of a blower door test is measuring your air changes per hour. Now air change per hour just really means if your home is sitting in a model environment, how long or how many times within one hour will it take for all of the air to infiltrate out of your home based on the current leakage that you have? Right? So that is very important. The higher the leakage, it means the more energy you're using. The lower the leakage means the less energy you're using. So for your home, always try to get a lower air change per hour. We'll talk about that in a little bit as well. Another thing that you'll hear with the envelope especially, Different components are, have different R values, and the R value really is just a resistance value. It's pretty intuitive here in this particular case. And the re resistance value really just means how reluctant that particular material is to take on and transfer heat. So all that nice big cotton stuffing that you have inside your wall, if you ever broke your wall open, that has an R value, and that will have a high R value. And that has a high R value because it's trying not to take on that heat from the inside of your home and put that heat outside, right? So the higher the R value for a material, the better it is. And sometimes you may hear that R value referred to as an RSI value. They're essentially just the same thing, just a little bit of a different measurement scale, but they're very similar. 
Now, Nick spoke about a joule before. And a joule is essentially just the smallest measure of energy. And it's equivalent to one watt passing through a given system per hour. Now, a joule can be expressed in tens and tens of thousands. So if you're expressing a megajoule, you're essentially expressing a thousand joules and giga and so on and so on. Now, the final term that I want to go over with you is incentives and rebates. And we'll talk about those throughout the presentation. But the difference between incentives and rebates just really means this. An incentive is something to incentivize you to do some sort of energy conservation type work. So an incentive will be paid before you do the work. A rebate will be paid after you do the work, right? So that's just the difference between two. You may hear rebates, incentives, grants, things like that. Doesn't really make a difference. It just really depends on when the money is going to be paid. We'll talk about that a little bit later, coming on to the end of your presentation as well. Now, one thing that I want to stress here that is extremely important, all of these programs, governmental programs, they start with a home energy evaluation. And you personally will have to reach out to a home energy advisor, an can rated advisor, and you will speak with that person. You said, OK, I'm ready to do some energy type work on my home. Uh, come and definitely give me an evaluation. What that evaluation will serve it will try to peg your home on a scale. So if you look over here to the right of my screen, you'd realize that I have a number of triangles here on a scale that is red, green, and yellow. And what this is really telling me is that the 74 here that's pointing downward, hopefully you're able to see that, is uh, this particular house, right? And a typical new house is a little bit to the right of that, just roughly about 90 gigajoules per year. If you see that, you'll see gigajoules per year. And this is one thing that the home energy evaluation really does. It pegs your home on a scale compared to other homes, compared to the average home for your area, compared to the average home for Canada as well. So it really tells you about how energy efficient you are compared to the accepted best practice or the, or the general standard. Now, another thing that the home evaluation does is it gives you a number of different um, criteria, so to speak. The first thing that you'll get is an action plan. And that action plan will really help you to detail, okay, which parts of my home should I target? Which parts of my home are most problematic? And what's gonna be the best value for me? Like I said, some of these uh, upgrades essentially take a lot of time and a lot of effort. So what's the best value to get out of that? And you'll get that out of your first audit where your energy auditor will work with you and tell you what is essentially best for you to do. Second thing that you'll get is an energy guide label. An energy guide label is really just a printout saying that your home uses X, Y, Z amount of energy. And again, like I said, you'll be able to use that to compare to the average standard in Canada as well. Now, I cannot stress enough that a first audit, the very first audit is absolutely required for re rebates and incentive programs. So if you're thinking about doing any energy type work to your home, any energy management related type work to your home, the first thing that you have to do is start with an energy audit. If you don't start with an energy audit, you may essentially uh, uh, peg yourself out of eligibility requirements. So the first thing that you have to do is ensure that you get that energy audit. That will put you at where you are on the scale, and then you would use that to compare that after you would have done your energy type work, you would be able to uh, compare uh, before and after. And that's the importance of the energy audit. Okay, okay moving on. Now, I'm hoping you're able to see this. And this is a blower door test. And the blower door test, whenever you call your energy advisor, what will happen is they'll show up at your home, you know, the time that you specify, what's not. And they'll put a big impeller in your door. This really means like a specialized fan. And then on top of that, they may take some images of your home. And those images are gonna be what's referred to as thermal images. Now, if you look at the right of my screen here, this is an example of a thermal image. If you look at the color scale at the bottom, it's showing you that you have the orange areas are warm areas, the blue areas are cool areas. So in this home, looking at this, based on this blur door test, you can see that all the hot air is sitting just inside up at the roof. And it makes sense because we know that hot air rises. That's not what we want. We wanna distribute that warm air all over the home, right? So that is one thing that comes out of your blur door test and working with your energy advisor can help you to target that, help you to make that change to your home and help you to be able to make that a bit more efficient, a bit better. 
Now you may see your energy advisor walking with a number of uh, pieces of equipment. You may see uh, the fan, like I just said, you will see a thermal camera for thermal imaging. You may see an anemometer to measure wind flow and direction in the home as well. The most important thing that comes out of your door door test is your air changes per hour. Remember I was saying how much leakage you're getting from your home, but well, that's essentially the most important thing that comes out of that. Now moving on smartly, I spoke about this a little bit earlier, but I said uh, the envelope, your building envelope is the exterior of your home. And this exterior is used for two main things. The first thing is that it separates various parts of your home. So in this image here on the left, you can see that it's separating the uh, basement from the rest of the home from the attic. And then the second thing is that it uh, keeps the inside of the home inside, it keeps the outside outside. So it really reduces heat transfer across your entire wall. And that's very important because that really will uh, uh, affect the performance of your home. Now, an example of that here, and this is an energy guide ta uh, tag coming out of your uh, first audit. This is an example of what you'll get. You'll see there are a number of things pegged here on the right. So you have your comparison on this scale, you have your current uh, consumption, and then you have your target. And that target is always net zero for every home because remember the entire Canada is supposed to be net zero by 2050. So that's the target for every home to be net zero as well. But this Energuide rating scale here and the audits really just show you essentially how much work you have to do in that time frame to get to that goal. Another thing that it allows you to do, it allows you to compare to the average house as well. So in this particular example here, you can see that this house is located in the general Ottawa area or the greater Ottawa area. It has a very poor envelope, so a little bit of an older home because it was built in 1981. And it's a regular two-story single family style house. And it has an older furnace, older uh, air conditioning unit, uh, ventilation system, things like that. And because of that, is pushing up the energy use in this particular example. And the only way to know that is coming out of your energy audit. Now, another thing that the energy audit tells you as well is it tells you your energy consumption. So if you look here on the right, where you see energy consumption, you'd realize here, it's saying to us that the largest consumer of energy in this particular scenario, in this particular home, 69% of the energy uh, being used by this home going to space heating. So it means that if we're able to target that space heating, we can essentially get quite a bit of value out of that. So it means maybe better furnace, maybe some insulation, things like that. And then we go about doing that. Another thing that you'll see here is the energy breakdown as well, which will tell you a little bit about what types of uh, energy sources are being consumed. So you'll be able to see that as well. Remember, we spoke about the difference between natural gas and uh, electricity. And the final thing that you'll see here on the bottom right, as your greenhouse gas emissions and your rated energy intensity. And the energy intensity really is a scale based on how much energy you consume compared to the square footage or the square meterage of your home, right? So that is uh, based on the size of your home, but it will tell you how much energy you're using per square meter, uh, which can be used to compare to other buildings as well. So little bits of uh, diagnostic information that you get here as well. Now, the value of the evaluation, and I'm just coming on to the end of my presentation here, the value is you're able to measure your air tightness. So you may be thinking, okay, my home is pretty airtight. I'm not feeling any drafts. It feels nice and warm and what's not. But it may be feeling that because, you know, your, your furnace is at a super high setting. You're using quite a bit of energy because of that. I'm sure some of you may be able to identify with that as well. I know I definitely can, right? So in that particular case, what you like to do is you want to identify air leaks. Uh, you want to uh, identify insulation options, whether it's uh, stuff in, blow in, uh, air creed, any of those other types of insulation, uh, any type of insulation that will work best for your home and your scenario. And then you also want to identify uh, various things that you can do to your windows and your doors as well, looking at your U value, uh, trying to beef up your insulation a little bit. And that's going to be very important to help you in that particular scenario. Now, another thing that the evaluation will give you is ratings for your heating and cooling systems. And you may be thinking, okay, well, I just bought this furnace maybe 10 years ago, but that may actually help you to realize that there are other products on the market that can help you with a retrofit or can be more efficient as well. And then on top of that, uh, you will also get suggested grants and suggested rebates that may be important for you as well. So even if you're thinking that this is a very costly venture, there may be some support out there and your NRCAN advisor will work with you to tailor 
some information for you to show you uh, which uh, incentive and rebate programs are best suited to you. So that is uh, part of the value of uh, the evaluation. And one thing that I wanna show you here is in terms of uh, air sealing uh, for space heating, you'd realize that in that particular scenario that we just looked at for that home, roughly about 69% of the energy went to space heating. And at the bottom here, you'll see, I have a little bit of a note, air leakage is responsible for roughly about 20% of the typical home's heat loss. So if we're able to get 20% of that 70%, that's essentially roughly about 14%, it's been a long day, don't quote me on the math, but you're able to get quite a bit of savings out of that. And one thing that I wanna show you here on the left is that the house works as a system. So you're drafting how much air filtration you're getting, will affect how your furnace and your air conditioning unit and your ventilation system are working as well. One will affect the other. So they go hand in hand, very important there as well. Now I think this is about my last or second last slide if I'm not mistaken, but I just wanted to share some of the costs with you of uh, some of the evaluations. And I'm sure that Scott and Stephen may speak to this a little bit later, but you know, the, the first audit for your home, anytime you're doing this type of work, is roughly about three hours, uh, depending on a number of factors. It's roughly about $400 Canadian for the cost of that audit. And then your second audit, after you would have done all the energy management type work, you did a, you know, maybe you put in a new furnace, maybe you did some ventilation work, some insulation work, and whatnot. The second audit after that to verify what you've done, it's roughly about $200. And of course, this is rated on the NRCAN scale. All of the advisors are NRCAN retained. And that will help you to detail what you've done. Now, there are a number of uh, utilities, and Enbridge being an example of that, that are running different programs to help with the cost of those audits. And uh, the total cost there is roughly about $600 for these two, edit, uh, two, these two audits. And you can see that Enbridge is giving roughly about $550 towards those, edits, uh, th towards those audits as well. And that's specifically if you're an Enbridge customer, right? So there may be some eligibility requirements there. Definitely check that out. And you'd realize for those two audits, you'll essentially pay $50, right? So that is an example of how the rebates and incentives work. Now, finally, I just wanted to share some information with you before I go, uh, places that you may find some other information. As I just detailed, an example would be local utilities, Enbridge, PowerStream, all those other utilities. Uh, you may find uh, uh, some information from there, and they may even have uh, their own programs. The Enbridge Home Energy Rebate Program, so the HER program, definitely look up for that one as well. City of Ottawa, as we spoke about with the Better Homes Loan Program, has some information as well. And then you will come across climate funds and not-for-profits as well. And some that I can mention off the top of my head, uh, the Toronto Atmospheric Fund is one of them. I think Project Neutral is another one. Uh, there are quite a few of them out there, right? There are a lot of companies that are doing this type of work. I'm sure that the comments will absolutely explode with some other examples uh, of these types of uh, companies because I'm sure several people know these types of companies as well. Now, at the federal level, you have the Greener Homes Program and the Greener Homes Program is uh, changing. Uh, like I said, we're, they're doing some work on that program. So you may see some tax rebates and things like that on the website uh, coming soon as well. So definitely check out the federal uh, program uh, that will be changing uh, in a few uh, weeks and months as well. Of notable mention for other information, the home CHMC, uh, Canada Home and Mortgage Commission, uh, you also have Save on Energy, and there are also some other uh, companies that do this type of work as well. So like I said, if you poke around Google, uh, you will definitely find that information that you're looking for. Now, that has been it for me this evening. I hope I was able to give you a bit of an overview on what to expect uh, for the rest of our presentation. And uh, if there are any questions, I'll definitely take those now from Nick. And after the question section, I'd like to hand it off uh, to, I believe, Scott, that is presenting next. So, yeah, thanks so much, Marcus. Yeah. Really great, uh, really great way to, to get things rolling. Some great resources there and uh, really demystified things for people, which is great and uh, got people used to the terminology, which is good. Julie was wondering, what does replacement lifespan mean in relation to the graphs? Uh, in relation to the, oh, I see here. Uh, let's see if I can go back to it very quickly. Uh, in relation to the graphs here, what you'd realize is that um, 
each of these components will have an essential lifespan. And that lifespan is essentially when they're working at their best. Now, if you look here, you'll see that the orange is the first lifespan. Uh, the green is when you replace it the first time, you replace it the first time, you'll have a second lifespan of that replacement. And then you replace it a third time, you'll have a third replacement. So in between now and 2050, you'll realize that for different components of our home, you realize you have several opportunities to be able to replace those. And think of it, when was the last time you replaced your refrigerator? Probably maybe within the last 10 to 15 years or so. Well, an example here is the refrigerator. You can see that it's already um, going to be needing to re be replaced before 2030. So let's say we replace it 2028. Another refrigerator after that is probably going to last maybe another 15, 20 years or so. They so can see just before 2040, we have to replace it again, right? So that's just what the graphs mean. It just really comes down to when you have to replace various components. And you'll see here that some components have a longer lifespan than others. No, oh, that's great. Uh, no, thanks so much. And I also want to thank uh, our, some of our members there for, for fielding some questions in chat, Dan, Vivian, and Chris Havitz. Thanks to them. We'll hear a bit from them later. Um, we did have another question about um, a uh, Marie says she would like to change my gas water heater to an electric one. Would the evaluation mm -hmm. help that to do that? Uh, absolutely. One thing that you can ask the uh, energy advisor to do is you can do a special calculation for your home. Now, I forget the name of it because it's very technical. It has a lot of long letters behind it. It's a CSA type um, calculation. And what that calculation really is for is to help you to understand how much energy your home needs and then to help you to size the equipment for your home as well. So it's called the proper sizing uh, calculation, the proper sizing of HVAC equipment. I don't, I should, should know this because I was working with it just a few days ago. But if you get that calculation done, uh, that calculation will help you to understand, you know, what's the best size of a furnace to use, what's the best size of an air conditioner to use. You don't want to size it too big because then it will just be too powerful and use too much electricity. And you don't want to size it too small because then you'll just be cold all the time, you'll be shivering, you'll be very uncomfortable in your home. So you don't want either scenario. So that calculation is uh, designed to get you just in the sweet spot in the middle. That's great. Uh, you know, important for people to know. Uh, Darren was wondering just about uh, total and home energy consumption. As we know, over 50% of energy usage is being consumed by the occupants of the home, devices, appliances. Mm -hmm. So does the, does the audit kind of cover some of that stuff? Uh, the audit does look at different parts of it. It looks at your plug load. It looks at your phantom load. Uh, that's essentially really about, you know, how you're consuming electricity within the home as well. But essentially, if you're looking at the entire home, it's not going to be the largest consumer of energy, right? Of course, you will have some appliances that will take some of your electricity and some of your natural gas, but essentially things like your space heating, your furnace and things like that, those things will take the most of the energy. So while doing that type of uh, retrofit work will help you, uh, looking at your furnaces, your windows, things like that will help you even more. Yeah, thanks so much, Marcus. There were a few questions about how people book an audit, how much it is. So we'll let the other guys kind of jump right. on that. Uh, but and then a, a few about the NRCAN, but because it was just announced, everybody, I don't think we'll be fielding too, too much on that. I did share some links in chat for everybody to look at that. It's literally a brand new portal. I went on at two o'clock this afternoon and the, the whole website was down. So right now it's back up and you can go ahead and uh, start your process of, of logging in and getting yourself a login and all that. So once again, thanks so much, Marcus. Really appreciate it. Uh, you'll, you'll hopefully stick around with us till the end if there's any follow-up questions. I will. But, uh, a really great way to start things out. Really appreciate that. Just a reminder to stop share and we'll, we'll roll over to Scott. Perfect. Thank you for having me. Now I will stop my sharing here. Let's see here if I can. Nope, that is not what I want. Uh, let's see here. There we go. <laughs> Great. Thanks, oh. Marcus. Appreciate that. And for anybody who uh, we didn't get to their question in chat, hopefully Dan and Chris can help out and we will have a follow-up section later, time pending. So next up, let's welcome Scott Mayer, who is the Energy Programs Manager over at Enviro Center. Scott is passionate about the opportunities to address global climate change at a local level through energy assessment and retrofits in the residential housing sector. He has over 20 years experience in residential building and construction project management. He is a registered energy advisor and holders hold a bachelor's degree in environment and resource studies from the University of Waterloo. Welcome Scott to come on in, unmute and share your screen. Thanks so much. 
Thank you very much, Nick. Much appreciated, and um, <clears throat> great to great to be here with everybody. This is like a big big turnout. Feels like I'm I must be breaking some kind of COVID protocols just by being in such a big group. Um, very pleased to be here, and it's a great presentation. And thanks, Marcus, for for kicking things off. Um, and judging by judging by the chat so far, we probably could have completely pivoted and just covered the greener homes. <laughs> program in this presentation. But uh, unfortunately, we probably don't know um, enough about the program yet to really talk uh, intelligently about it. It's, uh, it really is brand new. So, um, but definitely keep keep posted. It's it's going to be very exciting times coming up with, uh, with all of the programs that are being developed. So, um, but today I'm, I'm really going to just sort of um, cinch down and, and take a look at uh, exploring what happens when you're having an energy audit in your home. So for those who haven't explored the opportunity yet, or maybe it's been a long time, just a bit of a refresher about what uh, what you can expect when you have an energy advisor called into your home for the audit. And uh, I'm gonna see if I can share my screen as well here. So, I'm gonna try that, yeah. So hopefully everyone can can see that okay. Um, what to expect during a home energy audit, otherwise known as uh, energy assessments or energy evaluations. There's kind of multiple multiple terms for that, but uh, this is going to explore a little bit about what what happens when an advisor comes to your door. So what we will be talking about tonight. So just a couple of quick introductions to Enviro Center, which is the uh, the organization that I work with, and uh, and myself, Scott Meyer. Uh, touch on briefly the importance of home energy retrofits and uh, the role of the energy audit and the role of your energy advisor as well. And kind of a deep diver into uh, what to expect during the home energy audit and uh, briefly go into next steps. So moving from plans to action, which hopefully should transition fairly well to uh, what Stephen's going to be um, talking about tonight, which is really kind of taking, taking your reports and taking the evaluation results and and sort of moving those into a, into action. So EnviroCenter is a service organization, Natural Resources Canada service organization, and its mandate is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we do this through a variety of different programs and services, and uh, its mission is to provide people, communities, and organizations with practical solutions to lighten their environmental impact in lasting ways. So we lead by example and passionate about the work that we do. And I'm sorry, it seems like I might be on a timed response here. So hopefully I'm gonna get away from that. Um, so your presenter, so, sorry, I'm not sure what, why that is. No worries, Scotty, if you wanna take a minute to, to un, uh, unshare and maybe reset your slides yeah. there, no problems. That is odd, because I just went through it. So I apologize, everybody. We're on rapid mode today, so no worries. Yeah. Nice. yeah, I don't want to talk that fast. <laughs> um, let's see if this works. So uh, so I'm the service organization with uh, EnviroCenter. So in essence, I act as a liaison between Natural Resources Canada and registered energy advisors in the field. Uh, I'm actually a registered energy advisor myself. So I've been doing energy audits um, for about 20 years now. And uh, so I've been in a lot of attics over those years. Uh, but still really love love the work um, and really appreciate being able to help homeowners make uh, smart energy upgrade decisions for their homes. And also I've been a construction project manager, so involved in uh, residential renovation projects, design and implementation with a number of different builders and renovators um, in Ottawa. So what are the uh, the key benefits of energy upgrades? So why why would you go ahead and and get an energy assessment and consider making energy upgrades for your home. Uh, well, one key area would be knowledge and confidence. So knowing more about your home will allow you to make uh, smarter energy efficiency decisions um, in terms of your, your renovations. Savings, obviously when we're considering uh, energy use, if we can make energy upgrades that are gonna reduce our energy consumption, that will obviously translate into uh, reduced energy consumption and and reduced utility bills as well, which is ideal for most of us. Uh, better home comfort. So generally speaking, if we can sort of reduce the amount of drafts and, and uh, air moving through the home and, 
mitigate and control humidity levels in the home, uh, we end up with better home comfort overall for the occupants. Uh, health, so hand in hand with energy upgrades is often um, an improvement in indoor air quality, which uh, again will impact homeowner uh, health and reducing carbon footprint. Obviously, uh, by making energy upgrades, we can make dramatic reductions to our reliance on fossil fuels. So that's gonna reduce our carbon footprint and uh, have a minimal impact on, on our planet. And then of course, programs and rebates. Uh, Marcus talked a little bit about those. And I say, why not? If they're, if they're available, uh, it's a great incentive to get uh, Canadians motivated to make deeper energy retrofits in their homes. And now is quite an incredible time as far as uh, rebates and incentives go. Um, we've seen a lot of ups and downs in, in the industry and uh, rarely have we kind of felt such, such inertia right now in this field. So there's definitely a lot of interest. Uh, there's a lot of political will. And now there's also a lot of uh, money on the table for, uh, for homeowners to, to access. So all great reasons to, uh, to go ahead with energy upgrades in the home. So what is the, the role of the energy audit itself? Um, I think Marcus spoke to this uh, a little bit. And uh, you know, why would you consider an energy audit for the home? Uh, perhaps it's for one of, those, one of those reasons. You want to reduce your, your costs for, for fuel. Uh, you want to reduce your carbon footprint. Or maybe you just want to figure out how to get that, you know, upper room in the in the second floor a little bit warmer. So those are all great reasons to go ahead with an audit. Um, we would consider an audit as the first step in starting a green retrofit and making smart energy upgrades, and clearly identifying how your home uses and loses energy. So uh, I think in Marcus's slides again, you saw those uh, those labels that that showed you kind of the breakdown of of where the home was losing its heat and also how much of the energy is, is going towards space heating. So it really gives you a lot of perspective on, on what's happening in your home uh, and also shows you the most strategic ways to make changes, uh, which will improve the energy efficiency, indoor air quality and, and overall comfort. So, and what would the role of your energy advisor be? So uh, energy advisors are, are registered with Natural Resources Canada and uh, also with service organizations that are licensed to provide uh, the Energuide Rating System energy audits throughout Canada. Uh, so energy advisors uh, pass a certain number of exams and also completed a, a bunch of field training to get them prepared to be able to go out into the field and perform the energy assessments. And uh, as I said, they are called energy audits, energy evaluations, energy assessments. Um, but as long as they're uh, pinned to the Energuide rating system under Natural Resources Canada, they all run through the same protocol. Um, so your advisors are gonna provide information about your home's energy use and its performance, and they'll help to clarify and prioritize your energy upgrade options and opportunities. And they'll also provide valuable reports and ratings. Uh, some of the reports are going to sort of break down the house into its different components, give you an idea of the relative uh, performance in the different areas of your home. And some of the reports uh, one of them in particular is called the Renovation Upgrade Report, and it will uh, basically compare your home as it is right now with the same home with certain energy upgrades made to it. So it's a great kind of before and after, and, it, and it's, a, it's a picture of how of the effect of each upgrade on your home um, compared to the home as it is right now. So what happens during an energy audit? Um, I like to start at step one. So opening the door, what happens when the energy advisor knocks at your door? Uh, and I'm, I'm kind of taking a perspective of, of um, my personal experience, so how I usually move through an assessment. Again, there may be variations on you know, what happens in an energy audit with different advisors, but, but generally uh, we're collecting the same data, we're going through the same processes and procedures. The timing might change a little bit, but um, but I thought that's, that's probably the best way for me to, to explain. Um, so it's a general introduction. It's a hello, uh, introduce yourself, you might introduce a service organization, um, talk about the equipment that you're gonna have to bring into the house. Where's it gonna go? Is it okay to be leaning against the, in, the wall? Uh, how about the parking? Is there a place to, you know, can we leave our car parked in, in the driveway? That type of thing. So general introduction, just to get to know the, the homeowner uh, and, and an explanation then you know, what, what procedures and processes are going to be taking place in the home, which areas of the home are we going to need to be able to access, 
um, letting the homeowner know that there's going to be photographs. Uh, so if they don't want to be in any photographs, they should be aware. Uh, generally, homeowners don't want to be in, in the photographs. Um, and uh, so just basically a, a run through of, of the process, make sure that the homeowner is comfortable with, uh, with everything and, and provide opportunities to, to ask questions, um, which is the next section, which is really, really an important part for me. Uh, that's, a, that's a time to sort of go back and forth with the homeowner about you know, what their plans are for the house, uh, whether they've been in the house for a long time, what previous projects have taken place, uh, the homeowners are a great source of, of, um, of information. Energy Advisor is going to be on site for two, three hours. Uh, they're going to do their darndest to, to try and figure out all of the details of the home and understand it inside and out. Uh, but if there's some information we can glean from speaking with the homeowner and asking the right kind of probing questions, it's fantastic. It really provides us with that extra support um, that will help guide the rest of the assessment. And obviously we're doing some listening and considering. So as we're getting feedback from a homeowner, we're also considering how we are going to incorporate those questions, concerns, uh, and challenges that the homeowner might have uh, through our process of, of uh, exploring the house and analyzing the house. We wanna make sure that you know at the end of the day, uh, we're able to satisfy uh, the homeowner's intentions through the assessment. Um, you know, along with obviously providing the, the reports and so forth, but we want to make sure that, you know, the homeowner is happy that they've had the assessment, they've learned something at the end of the day, and we're, we're helping solve some, some challenges or, or problems, if possible. Uh, step two, uh, usually exterior data collection. So kind of the next stage is to, to head outside, uh, get a few rough sketches of the house, um, get some photographs. Uh, Natural Resources Canada requires photographs of all elevations of the home. So photos of the front sides and the, and the rear of the home, making sure that we're incorporating all of the windows and doors as well. And uh, also the, the front photo will be uh, front and center on, on your reports. So uh, we kind of take a little extra care to, to make sure we get a, a good one of your, of your front house. And, uh, and then some measurements. Although most of the measurements in, in an energy assessment are going to take place from the interior, um, and we're, some, of the some of the measurements are actually required for the exterior. Uh, one of those is a, a height of a foundation above grade. So uh, that basically is how much your foundation wall is sticking up above the grass all the way around the house. And that gives us uh, some insight into you know, how much heat loss is happening uh, through the foundation walls. They happen a little bit faster through you know, above grade than below the earth. Uh, also, we might take some measurements uh, for overhangs. You can see in this house, there's an overhang that's hanging over one of the front windows. We want to know how much potential shading um, that overhang could, uh, could affect on the window. So taking some measurements about how deep that overhang is and how high above the window, those types of measurements. Uh, also taking some information down about some of the equipment that might be on the exterior of the house. So we might be finding the air conditioner or, uh, or heat pumps potentially uh, solar installations. So those will all be uh, equipment that would be uh, making note of from the exterior and also getting a, getting a sense of the general site conditions. So how's, you know, what is the grading like? Does it look like there might be some water infiltration issues? Uh, what are the, what's the sort of the condition of the, of the building materials? It looks like things are in disrepair. So all, all information that we can use to sort of tie back in to help the homeowner uh, understand their home as a, you know, in the big picture, making sure that our recommendations for upgrades are taking into consideration uh, as much information as possible. Um, and generally on the exterior, I like to just take it all in. Uh, it's important to kind of get a sense of the shape of the house, the orientation. Uh, once you're into the back room in the basement, it's easy to get turned around. So this is a good, good time to sort of get oriented uh, and, then, and then carry that into the home. So step three, that would be sort of the interior data collection. Uh, so in here, we're talking uh, a lot about measurements and measuring geometry. Um, so we're, we're starting to sketch out some floor plans. We're measuring the length and width of different rooms, uh, measuring the perimeter of the walls. Uh, we're also measuring ceiling heights and slopes. This, this advisor here is using a laser tape measure, which is a nice fancy one to use. So you don't have to sort of extend your tape measure way up at a 20 foot slope ceiling. Uh, so they're great um, and a lot of advisors will be using those, but um, everybody uses their own, their own tools that they like. 
and uh, also generally coming out with the, the surface areas and, and volumes uh, in the house. So the more measurements we take, uh, the more understanding we have about the surface areas of the home envelope that Marcus was talking about. So that, that home envelope is that defining line between inside the conditioned space of the home and outside the unconditioned space. So the more surface area that we have between uh, inside and outside of the home envelope, uh, the more potential heat loss, right? Um, and also some of those dimensioning and, and measurements we're taking is to perform volume calculations. So some of this stuff goes back to grade 10. Uh, you might forget about it, but um, that's something that your advisor is going to be doing all, all the time on site, uh, a lot of geometry calculations. And those volume calculations are going to be used down the road um, for some of the air leakage uh, measurements and metrics. Um, moving on for interior data collection is also evaluating windows and doors. So, uh, you know, why would we want to? Why would we want to be measuring the windows and doors? Usually, when we think about energy efficiency in homes, often the first thing that jumps to mind for a lot of people is windows and doors, and certainly they. They can definitely have a, a large impact on the energy efficiency and performance of the home. So the advisor is going to be uh, dimensioning those, measuring the, the heights and widths of all the windows and making notes of which way they're oriented, whether they're south, north, east or west, it all, all uh, has an impact. Um, what the glazing is like, what the glass is, is there two panes of glass, is there a single pane of glass, does it look like there's any special insulating gases in between the panes of glass? Uh, there are certain coatings on, on the glazing. Um, what are the frames made out of? Do they look like they're in good shape? Are they in poor repair? Um, do they not close properly? Are they cracked? All of these things help to both provide some insight into uh, how well the, the window is performing in terms of energy efficiency. And also, importantly, um, whether the timing is right for looking at a, at a window uh, or door replacement. As most of us know, windows and doors are expensive components for the home and they do impact energy efficiency, but they may not be the top priority uh, for replacement. So yeah, again, the energy advisor is going to help to, to uh, uh, clarify um, whether they are in good priority standing as far as energy upgrades go in the home, you may be planning them anyways, in which case they might give some good guidance on what kind of windows to look at. Um, but obviously, if they're in poor condition, they might get reprioritized in, in the equation because we're not just looking completely at energy efficiency, but we're also working with your plans uh, and, and also obviously the life cycles of the materials themselves. Uh, investigating construction profiles. So, I think Mark has talked a little bit about this as well. Uh, what is a construction profile? I mean, you know, in my mind, it's basically just how the how the elements and components of the home are constructed and what materials are they made with. So I liken it to those you know home, those uh, anatomy anatomy books where you, you basically peel back different layers and you can kind of see in, inside uh, a, a person. And we would love to be able to do that for the for a home. Because uh, we can spend a lot of time uh, working our way, trying to figure out exactly how a home is constructed, what kind of insulation is in the walls, um, and it's and it can be difficult. And it really often depends on the age of the home. Uh, the newer the home, obviously, uh, the more tied to to current building code standards they are. And we know if we're walking into a home, if a home is built in the nineteen mid nineteen eighties. We have a very good sense of how the home is constructed, um, what kind of wood framing might be used, what kind of insulation and, and what depth. Uh, so what R values, as Marcus was talking about, might be in the insulation and, and constituted in those walls. Same thing with floors and ceilings. Uh, once we get into the older homes, um, you know, before 1950, insulation was not common in a, in a home at all. So if the home was built in 1930s, we might be walking in thinking of assumption that there's no insulation in these walls. Uh, so then it's up to the advisor to really do some sleuth work and some, some uh, investigations to try and determine have the walls been upgraded at some point in time or are they still completely uninsulated? Uh, so it might take a fair bit of digging and uh, it often takes a, a significant chunk of time uh, for an advisor to do that. And if the home has had three or four additions on it over the years, it's kind of like doing an assessment on uh, on three or four different homes. So 
definitely careful work and uh, something that you know a, a well-experienced energy advisor uh, is very good at determining. Um, and, and it's a very important process in the energy assessment itself. So documenting mechanicals and equipment. So obviously very important roles to play in the energy performance of the home is, is how we're actually supplying space heating, uh, how we're heating the, the water in the home and uh, how we're managing ventilation required uh, airflow through the home. Uh, so heating systems, we see the, the energy advisors well-versed at all the different types and styles. Uh, so they'll be noting what kind of fuel source it is, whether it's gas or oil or electricity what type of uh, system it is and how efficient it is. Uh, and also again, noting, you know, the age, is this, is this kind of coming up on the time when you'd actually replace a, a heating system? And especially in context of some of the newer programs and the movement towards electrification and, uh, and newer technologies, maybe it's also looking at transitioning away from natural gas heating systems and moving into uh, electric heat pump systems. So that's definitely something that uh, we're seeing more conversations in the home uh, and advisors are, are really starting to have that dialogue with, with homeowners to see if, if that's also part of their, their long-term energy planning. Uh, hot water heating systems as well. We're looking at, you know, is this just the old standard tanks or does a homeowner have an on-demand or a tankless system or maybe it's a, it's a combo system that's, that's uh, joined with the space heating uh, system in the, in the home. Uh, and then ventilation also. So the, the advisor is going to be looking at what kind of components in the home are providing uh, the opportunity to bring in fresh air and to exhaust stale, moist household air. Uh, sometimes that may just be a couple of bathroom fans, kitchen fan potentially, uh, and sometimes particularly in newer homes that might be built more airtight where ventilation is more critical. Um, whole house ventilation systems that might be balanced. You may have heard uh, terms like a heat recovery ventilator or an energy recovery ventilator. So those are systems that uh, bring in a supply of fresh air and they exhaust the same, they exhaust stale moist household air at a balanced rate. So whatever they're bringing in, they're exhausting and they're making sure there's a constant flow of uh, fresh air for home occupants. And they're doing that in an energy efficient way. So they're actually transferring some of the heat from the from the air that's leaving to the cold air that's coming in. So you're not just bringing in fresh freezing cold air, you're also bringing in preheated warm air that's, uh, that's gonna help with your overall ventilation requirements. Uh, so step four, I'd say is, is kind of moving into the blower door test. Uh, Marcus spoke a little bit about that and, and had some great examples of, of how the blower door test works. And, and in essence, uh, he nailed it. You know, what the heck is a blower door? It's a, it's a big fan that we use to measure air leakage rates in the home and also identify where the air leakage is, is occurring. So preparing for the blower door test, uh, that's something that uh, takes, may take a little bit of time uh, in the home and the energy advisor may even ask uh, a homeowner to help with this occasionally. So just making sure that all the windows and doors are closed in the home, uh, any window air conditioners are, are pulled out uh, that's great to happen before an advisor gets to, gets to the home because they're often pretty heavy and uh, not a lot of fun to move. Um, so that's something that usually you'll be prompted for before even the, the, uh, the assessment takes place. Uh, also making sure that uh, mechanical systems, so if you have a furnace, it's turned off or the thermostat is turned right down so that it doesn't engage in the middle of the blower door test. Same thing with hot water tanks, potentially turning it down to uh, turning it down to the pilot light only or on vacation mode, make sure that a water heater doesn't come on in the middle of the test. Um, so a few things, oh, and a, a very important one, uh, making sure that if you have a wood burning fireplace, uh, that the damper is closed and also that any ash is completely pulled out of that uh, fireplace. Um, we're really scared about that one. So as an energy advisor, the last thing you want is to crank up that fan, start sucking air in through all the leakage points in the home of which your chimney is probably a very big one. Uh, and if there's ash in the fireplace, it just gets strewn around the house. So definitely something that we wanna make sure in, in terms of preparing prior to the blower door test. Um, and then the blower door test is used to quantify air leakage rates. So as Marcus said, what we're trying to determine is 
when the air is getting pushed out, how well is the shell or envelope of the home doing at resisting air from blowing back in? Is it just coming in as fast as it's leaving or is the shell of the home doing a really, really good job at keeping it out? So if it's keeping it out really well, the air leakage rates will be low. If it's not keeping it out and the air just keeps whistling back in to take its place, uh, those air change rates are high. So we're, we're trying to determine the air changes per hour in that kind of test. Uh, one of the other blower door tests that's happening is an air leakage identification test. Uh, that's often a pretty exciting process. Um, and even for the homeowners who maybe weren't all that interested in the, in the audit itself, and maybe more so uh, just the grants and the rebates, typically um, what we'll find is once we kind of run that blower door test and, and take the homeowner around the house to show them all the sources of air leakage, they, the eyes light up, they start to get really, really keen, they're, they're starting their aha moments, that's why that's uncomfortable over there, and they're, and they're sort of taking upon themselves to do a little DIY and, um, and look, for, look for projects that they can do in terms of reducing air, air leakage in the home by doing some air sealing work. So the air leakage identification, while the fan is running, the air is being drawn back in through the envelope of the home, uh, we're able to go throughout the home and actually detect that either Sometimes you can see it, sometimes you can feel it with your hands, and sometimes advisors will use sort of um, devices like a puffer or an incense stick to actually uh, help uh, identify where that air leakage is coming in and, and how much it's coming in. So that's a, that's a fun process um, and, uh, and also a requirement of the audit. And just to note, you don't actually have to memorize all of those locations. Uh, the advisor should be going through them before they leave at the end of the assessment, but uh, those locations uh, and explanations should sh also show up in your report. So once you do receive your report, you can kind of use that as a guide to go back through the house and do some air sealing. Uh, and then quickly, there's a, there's a backdraft test, which is a, a test, quick test that um, advisors will do just to make sure that there's no safety issues with um, some of your combustion appliances bringing gases, exhaust gases back into the house when you're running some of your ventilation equipment. So that's, uh, that's a health and safety um, test that we're required to complete. And uh, if there are any concerns, your advisor will let you know um, that there are, there are issues and, and ways to mitigate that. Scott, I just want to uh, give you a heads up for a couple minutes, uh, if we can wrap up, and then we've got a couple questions for you as well. Sure, Thanks. sure. That was, the, that was the heavy part. So yeah, wrapping up, step five, good point. Uh, putting the house back to normal, so getting uh, all the windows open back up, the furnace back on. Uh, we discussed some of the finding results of the audit and, and making sure that we're tying that back into the homeowner's original concerns, and then setting expectations. So when will the reports come? What are the next steps? and usually some paperwork. So making sure that any paperwork is signed off on and, and documents and forms, which always come with these assessments. Um, and then just quickly after your, your audit is done, your advisor will go back to the office and, and uh, or kitchen table, whatever it is, run some calculations and check the documents, make sure everything looks good. They'll start to model your home from all of their data collection through an energy simulation software that will, will create these reports and labels for your home. Uh, they will also submit the file, house file to Natural Resources Canada for acceptance, and then send out the reports and labels to, to, uh, to the homeowners. And then just as a bit of a transition um, to Stephen's uh, presentation, so just putting plans into action. Energy audits are an important part of assessing your home energy performance and creating a roadmap. Your energy advisor will help set priorities, provide guidance to make the right energy upgrades in the right order. And with the right approach and planning, we can improve our existing homes to be more energy efficient, more sustainable, and less impactful in the natural world. And uh, the next step would be yours. Thanks so much, Scott. Yeah, great to see you. Uh... Great to see everything that's going on there and uh, all the hard work you're doing. And uh, yeah, great to hear that the homeowners can kind of get involved and and uh, that'd be pretty neat to to get those blower door tests going and get those aha moments. Um, uh, Mary, Mary's just wondering, is there a time limit? Is there a time limit between the time you get your energy audit and the second visit that is best for rebates and things? Yeah, it does depend on the program. So it, it changes from program to program. Um, there is one program, which is the Enbridge Home Efficiency Rebate Program. 
And in that, Enbridge does stipulate 120 days, so four month turnaround, although in COVID that's kind of blown wide open and you know we're in and out of, of program shutdowns and, and so forth. So uh, they're a little bit more lenient with that just within the context of COVID. Uh, sounds like with the Greener Homes program, there will not be a, uh, a required timeline, although they will be uh, encouraging completion within two years. But so, other so programs may change, yeah. Someone was wondering, because uh, they didn't see your uh, Enviro Center and the drop-down list of the NRCAN registration page. So assume you guys are involved and that's maybe just a bit of a, of a miss, uh, maybe flag that for you, I guess. Yeah, I'm going to make a note of that. Yeah, for sure, because I know that's fresh today that it just opened up. So yeah. definitely Enviro Center is involved, everybody. Uh, thanks for that question. We've got John wondering, does an energy audit take into consideration the surroundings of the house, trees, pavement, things like that? Um. As suggested, not critical information for building the um, the energy model for the home necessarily, except for potentially shading uh, based on components that are uh, part of the house. Like I said, whether it's an awning or a, or a front entry overhang, those types of things. Um, but but definitely, as we start to move into considering. Um, new kinds of higher technology, solar installations and so forth. That's something that your advisor is going to want to be taking a look at. Um, general site conditions um, that might relate to some of the some of that new equipment. Um, there are opportunities to do some um, some modeling of, of solar upgrades uh, for homeowners through uh, through our software, but it's still going to be recommended that uh, homeowners will work with a, a qualified solar designer for those final um, final designs. So to some degree, yes, uh, we are taking down um, information about the site conditions. Um, again, might relate to grading or water infiltration, those types of things, um, but they're more supplemental, supplemental information to provide to the homeowner. That's great. So one last one from Moira. She's just wondering, does the evaluator go on the roof? <laughs> um, I have not been on the roof before. Uh, so I've been in a lot, every other place in the house. There but, you go. But generally, no. And I think that might be the differentiation between uh, a home inspection and, and a home energy evaluation. So home inspections will definitely be looking at the roof um, as a structural component and maybe some of the materials. Uh, again, if an energy advisor notices that um, there are issues with the with the roof materials, building materials, and it may be cause some susceptibility issues to water infiltration and penetration. Um, definitely will make note of that, but um, no, most energy advisors don't end up going up onto the roof. And just a word on costs, is it the 600, does that cover your guys' fee through Envire Center? Is that about right or is that a variable? Uh, I would say it's a bit of a gray area right now. Um, that's what Enercan has promise that they will be covering for the two assessments. Enbridge covers $550 towards the assessments. We're not sure how those two are gonna interplay. Um, so there's two different programs providing two different rebates towards the cost of the audits. Uh, and assessments cost different things depending on the service organization, depending on the region. Um, service organized, it's not standardized um, yeah. and it's, it's not, um, it's not a requirement of service organizations to charge uh, a certain amount. So uh, I think that's probably with the advent of the new program, service organizations will be kind of looking at, at, at the, those fee structures in relation. Um, to be honest, fees have changed relatively little over the last, over a decade. Um, I would say if you're, if you're comparing most service organizations uh, across the country, at least in Ontario, uh, been pretty stagnant for since the last federal program, which was up to 14 years ago. So um, we could see an increase. Well, well, thanks so much, Scott. Great, great information. There's there's quite a few uh, questions still coming through on chat. Sorry if we didn't get a chance to answer them, everybody. Um, if you do want to make sure that you uh, address your questions to everyone, as opposed to just me, as I see there's a few people just pinging them to me, then our members will have a chance to answer them. So don't feel shy. Go ahead and put your questions out to everyone, everybody. Thanks so much, Scott. Just a reminder to, to stop share and mm -hmm. uh, really appreciate that presentation and look forward to uh, 
uh, you know, working with you and Enviro Center on uh, rolling out all this good stuff. Yeah, great. Thanks so much, everybody. Cheers. So next up for our last presentation, we've got uh, Stefan Magnaron, and he's from Home Soul Building Solutions. He's the lead energy consultant and Ontario regional manager over there. He is a registered energy advisor, passionate about energy efficient, sustainable and affordable construction and uh, renovation. Uh, he's got extensive experience as a skilled passive house planner and modeler, and he has been involved in over 20 passive house projects. Uh, he is recognized as the best residential energy consultant in Ontario in 2016. So well done. And uh, he is also a fire spinner, expat Australian, and lives with his wife and two girls in Orleans. So welcome everybody, Stefan Magnaron. Thanks, Nick, for the great introduction. And thanks, Marcus and Scott, for... Uh, uh, teeing up uh, the first two presentations and, and setting up my presentation. Uh, so a little bit of background. Uh, my, uh, I've been with HomeSol for um, about 10 or 11 years now, and HomeSol has been around since 1999, and we've conducted thousands of energy audits. Uh, we spanned all of the uh, green building um, programs from Energide to Energy Star uh, for new homes, R2000, uh, net zero homes, including uh, net zero ready, net zero energy, and also uh, net zero retrofits, uh, passive house for both the FIAS and uh, the German standard. Uh, and we're also lead providers in green raiders. So we, we run the gamut. Um, so our focus on this particular uh, presentation is on the Energide system for existing homes uh, with a focus on net zero. So before I get stuck into the, uh, you know, the, the, the post retrofit, uh, post audit scenario, uh, I wanted to point out that, uh, you know, time spent in reconnaissance is seldom wasted as John Marsden uh, quotes. Uh, and that's just to say that, you know, that there are many programs coming down the road. There's the Greener Homes program, there's the CMHC loan, uh, there's the Better Homes program. Uh, there's even uh, an, another one that's not even in, uh, um, involved with uh, energy and it's about uh, water. So the city is coming out with something like that. So many things coming down the road. So uh, at this point, we just need to take a breath, do some planning and, uh, and, and do some research and, and get started. And one of the best ways to get started, obviously, as, as we've been discussing, is with an energy uh, evaluation. So uh, from the energy evaluation, uh, you'll get three documents. And this kind of outlines that you're, you're starting to recognize some of this literature a little bit. On the left-hand side, you've got the Energide label, which uh, Marcus and Scott have, uh, have um, nicely uh, described. In the middle, we've got a, they're usually about a four page in homeowner information sheet, which essentially outlines uh, what went into the energy model um, from the uh, exterior enclosure, the windows, and it also outlines uh, where the heat loss is happening in your home. So it's good information for how your house is right now. Uh, on the right hand side is the first page of the renovation upgrade report. Uh, and this is, you know, in this particular example, it's about 14 pages and it outlines your path to net zero, essentially. Um, so I'll, di I'll dive into it a little bit more here. So this is a, just zooming in on that first page of the upgrade report. And you see uh, at the top, there's uh, where your house is currently. Uh, and this house is a, a in the red zone, so it needs a lot of improvement. It compares it to a typical house, and because this is in Ontario, it's comparing it to uh, an Ontario reference house, uh, which is different to the National Building Code. Uh, Ontario tends to have a, a more stringent energy uh, code, the SB12. And then on the top there, on the green end, is the potential. So essentially, if you implement all the upgrades recommended in this report, that's where you could get to. Now, obviously the goal is zero uh, and, and we can speak to that uh, a little bit later. Just below that, which is also on the front page is the, the top four of the uh, priority list of your roadmap. Um, 
and that will be tailored based on your situation uh, that was discussed between you yourself and the Angie advisor. So typically, um, depending on the uh, your circumstances, so Scott mentioned that when he gets to a house, he asks questions. So from that, depending on what you have planned, depending on the, the condition of your house and uh, all these other things, uh, that will determine the priority list uh, on how to move forward. But if you don't have a plan yet, then it's up to the registered energy advisor to guide you in that sense. So typically we recommend performing air sealing as the number one approach. Um, it's the lowest hanging fruit, so to speak, from an energy conservation perspective, but it also has the added bonus of uh, increasing your building durability uh, and, uh, and also making you more comfortable in, in the house. Uh, it also has a huge impact on the sizing of the mechanical systems, which we'll get to as we move along. Uh, so here's a typical screenshot of that upgrade. So with each upgrade, you'll have a, um, a section up here that says essentially where you are at now. Uh, and if you implement the upgrade that was in the report, how much you could save in gigajoules per year. Uh, and then below that, there's some useful tips. Uh, oftentimes there are links that you can uh, access to get more information. And, and then below that, there's a, a section where your uh, energy advisor can give you um, more tailored comments uh, for your particular situation. Uh, so in this particular case, it's just outlining the areas where um, air leakage usually happens. Uh, it, Typically in a house we'll have, uh, when the energy advisor has gone through and identified uh, actual leaks for your house, oftentimes we'll include potential strategies on how to overcome or seal that, those leaks. Um, and then uh, in, in this particular one, we also mentioned that there's a comprehensive approach where you, know, you could seal every individual leak uh, in your house, which um, is a great DIY approach. Uh, and can be effective. Uh, but then you might also want to consider a, a more comprehensive approach where either you're doing a chainsaw retrofit, so a full exterior approach to your deep energy retrofit, where you're going to be taking off the siding and taking off the roof and sealing from the outside uh, and then adding windows and, and things like that, uh, which is in this uh, image here. And I'll, I'll speak to that in, in a little bit more uh, detail soon. Um, or you can take an interior approach. So if you're in the process of doing a big renovation in your house uh, and you're not going to touch the outside, but you're going to be essentially gutting the inside of the house, then there are many methods that you can take to uh, perform air sealing on the inside. Uh, and right here, you, you can see Aero Barrier is one technology that can be implemented in that particular case uh, to do a really great job of air sealing the house. Um, before you cover things up and, and uh, complete your renovation. So uh, looking at this image here on the right, uh, it speaks to the thermal enclosure or the thermal envelope uh, and areas where you might want to consider uh, increasing insulation uh, and adding some air tightness. So we start at the roof. Uh, if you're one of the questions that I often ask when I get to a site is, how old is your roof? Or maybe I'll see that the, the shingles are curling and, and I say, okay, well, you're, you're planning and uh, you're probably in the position where you're gonna be uh, redoing your roof. So maybe now's the time to consider uh, adding insulation above the roof. And, uh, but before you do that, you actually um, air seal the outside. Uh, now that, that's a bit unconventional, but it's uh, it's been shown to uh, be a very effective way of doing air sealing. The alternative is if you add insulation to your attic, which is the more uh, common way of doing things. Um, but there are several downfalls to that. Uh, and the first one is that with typical old houses, the uh, where the where the roof meets the wall, uh, it's, there's usually not a lot of space. So the effective R value, uh, it reduces the effective R value of the, the um, 
the roofs, the attics insulation because um, it's, it creates a bit of a wedge, a cheese wedge, if you will. Um, and so at that wedge section, there's not that much insulation. So another one thing that you might want to consider if you do top up insulation in your attic is that first you must air seal. Uh, that's the primary thing. So if that's, uh, that can be tricky in some low slope roofs, but essentially what you want to do is take off a lot of the insulation that's existing there, perform a lot of air sealing for all, all the penetrations that are coming up into the attic, uh, and then adding insulation after that. This is critical um, because ice damming is an issue that happens with many older homes, and the number one uh, source of ice damming issues is air leakage. So warm, moist air enter, uh, exiting the house and entering the attic uh, and then heating up the sheathing and melting the snow. Uh, so then with the walls, um, obviously in an existing house, you have one of two options. You can either add more insulation to the interior, but you lose floor space, or you can add it to the exterior. Obviously the best time to add insulation to the exterior if you're, is if you're already uh, replacing the siding. Uh, and then obviously the, some homes aren't in that position at all because there's brick and you don't want to get rid of the brick. So you kind of uh, suck. Um, so that's where the report will kind of show you what the pros and cons are uh, as far as uh, what method you might want to choose. And then in the basement, um, Obviously, if you have a finished basement or if you've recently finished the basement, you're not going to rip it out to add insulation. If you hadn't added insulation during the, uh, the finishing of the basement, then an exterior approach might be appropriate. Uh, and obviously that can be an expensive endeavor excavating around the foundation, but there are a couple of ways around it. Uh, one, for example, is called HydroVac, where they'll come in and uh, put a high pressure hose um, right up against uh, in, in the soil and, and actually vacuum it out so that you have enough space to put some insulation. Uh, and and that, that would be a great method of doing it. Uh, if you happen to be doing foundation work anyway, uh, then that's a great time to add insulation to the exterior of your foundation wall. Um, and that's essentially it. Uh, the only additional cost there is the, the cost of the actual insulation. And of course, if, if you finished your basement and uh, that there's no way to add insulation to the slab. But in some cases, your basement might be completely unfinished. So that's why uh, a good upgrade report will be very comprehensive and include the entire thermal enclosure because you never know in the future what situation you might be in. So having the, uh, the knowledge from this report of what you could do is very, very valuable. So windows are another upgrade that you will, you may want to consider. Uh, there's a lot that we ask of windows. Um, they, they keep the weather out. They're our air barrier and uh, thermal control layer. And they're also the vapor barrier as part of that uh, section of the wall or roof in the case of the skylight. Uh, and so the, the windows, the, there are a lot of window companies out there. Um, and essentially from a, an energy modeling point of view uh, and from a comfort point of view, the, the big numbers that we look at are the uh, U factor next to the green tick over here and the solar heat gain coefficient next to this other green tick over here. Uh, and what you want to look at is for a window that has a really low U factor and a, and a moderately low solar heat gain coefficient or SHGC. Uh, the low U factor, mean, the lower the U factor, the, the less thermal transmission there is through the uh, through the window as a whole window component. It's kind of like an inverse of the R value. So the higher the R value, the better. Uh, the lower the U value, the better. Um, and with the solar heat gain, it's uh, it's a bit of a th th this is a bit more of a tricky one because as we make our houses more energy efficient, the higher solar heat gain windows can lead to overheating. And this can happen in the summertime, it can happen in the shoulder seasons, but as we add more insulation and make our homes tighter, um, then that's sort of the unintended consequences. We often think that in Canada, we have a, uh, we're a heating dominated climate, 
Uh, but really, in, in, in fact, in Ottawa, where we see the extremes of both, we have extreme colds and extreme hu hot, humid summers. So uh, a low so heat, um, a low U factor uh, is great for the winter time, but it also helps in the summertime. And a low solar heat gain coefficient will help uh, maintain comfort all year round. Some windows, if it, you know, so, some homeowners might want to put exterior in, operable blinds, which will help shade and be a passive cooling strategy, but that's not as common. Uh, and it requires owner occupant um, uh, input into the functioning of the house. Uh, so the safe bet would be to go for a low solar heat gain uh, window. Another, um, another rating system for windows that we see is the energy rating. And I caution you to not go for a window using that rating because um, it's, a, it's an algorithm that takes into fa factor the, uh, the U value and the solar heat gain coefficient, uh, and the higher the number, the better. But what we find is that high solar heat gain glazing uh, windows uh, tend to do better with the energy rating, but they might have a really high U factor, which means they lose a lot of heat, uh, so, which is bad. Um, and as I've discussed, a, a high solar heat gain coefficient window may not be ideal in your circumstances, especially if you've got west facing windows and a lot of west facing windows, there's no way to block that sun. So a high U value, no good, a high solar heat gain combo, probably not the best. And that usually results in a high energy rating. So I, I uh, encourage you to, to stay away from that as a, a way of evaluating the performance of a window. Uh, I'll just go back a little bit because, uh, oh, actually, no, I'll, I'll, I'll keep going forward. Sorry. Uh, another part of the report that we, uh, that I really like is this. Uh, it, it sort of outlines where the heat loss is happening through your thermal enclosure uh, before and after the upgrades that are suggested in the report. And this helps actually guide the, uh, the recommendations. Because uh, obviously, if you look here, the, the, at, in this particular house, the adding insulation to the attic makes a dramatic uh, difference in the gigajoules per year uh, or the heat loss. Uh, windows are huge. Um, actually, the, this, this house requires a lot of improvement. You can see there's a lot of room for improvement for this house. Um, and so it's, it's, really, uh, uh, um, it's really up to the homeowner to see what they would really want to, which direction they want to go with and what step to take first. Uh, the air leakage here in this case, um, just to give you an idea, uh, this would be uh, aiming for a net zero level of air tightness, which is 1.5 ACH. So that's why you get that dramatic increase. Now, typically for rebate programs, they're not going for that level of air tightness. Uh, ultimately, we want to get to zero, um, but we understand that it's, uh, it's challenging. And so typically to get uh, air tightness, rebates, uh, they usually set a target of 10 to 20%. Uh, but this illustrates the importance of air tightness. Then the graph below uh, with the black and green is the energy consumption um, after the uh, before and after the uh, thermal enclosure upgrades. But it also includes the performance of the uh, mechanical systems. Uh, so typically, going from a 74 gigajoule per year space heating to nine gigajoules per year, that's a combination of all those thermal enclosure upgrades and reducing that heat loss, uh, but also adding a, an air source heat pump, uh, which is very efficient from an energy point of view. Uh, and over on the right-hand side, we've got the greenhouse gas emissions, uh, and you can see the, uh, the reduction from the current 5.3 tons per year, all the way down to 0.3 tons per year. Uh, and honestly, the, the biggest step you can take to reducing the, your greenhouse gas emissions is by converting from uh, a fossil fuel uh, appliance to a, a heat pump. And just a quick note uh, at the bottom of the graph of the before and after estimated use, you can see that the lights and appliances and other electrical remain the same. And these are very much defaults. Um, they, they normalize everyone that everyone's occupants, 
uh, and and the um, the base loads of how they uh, the appliances and lighting and all, plug loads and all that kind of stuff, and that's kind of fixed. Um, and it's a way of normalizing things for the rating program because uh, one house with different occupants will have a, a different energy profile. So this is a way of keeping it nice and neutral in that sense. Uh, and so your Energuide rating, uh, while it is to your house, um, it's similar to a uh, the liters per hundred for vehicles where it could say it's five liters per hundred but your mileage may vary depending on how you drive and whether you drive more on the highway or more in the city or if you're a lead foot you know, or what have you. So that's a little bit of a brief explanation on, on those graphs, which I use often to guide my uh, recommendations. So as we're talking about getting the house tighter uh, from an air tightness point of view, uh, this is an adage in building science that you wanna build it tight, but ventilate it right. Uh, because essentially, um, as you get it tighter, you really need to exhaust those uh, stale, that stale air and the excess moisture in the house and, uh, and keep things moving. Now, another way of um, calling these ventilation systems, uh, you could call it a fresh air system, or you could call it an automatic window, because it's bringing that fresh air in uh, without the penalty of having to heat it up again, because they, they have the cores that exchange the heat. Um, in our climate, we, because uh, we are very hot, cold and dry in the winter time and hot and humid in the summertime, we recommend that uh, ERVs are more appropriate for our climate because ERVs do the same as HRVs. HRVs are heat recovery ventilators. ERVs are energy or enthalpy recovery ventilators, and they exchange some of the humidity in the air. So without actually cross contamination. So as the cold, dry air is coming in and the warm, moist air is going out, the heat is exchanged and some of that moisture is exchanged so that your house doesn't dry out uh, in, in the wintertime. In the summertime, it does the opposite. So that warm, moist air that's coming in, uh, it's getting exchanged to the cooler, dry air of the indoor environment. And that moisture gets put into that ex. Uh, exiting airstream uh, so that you don't increase the humidity in your house. Now, once again, as we build tighter homes and we add more insulation to the houses, uh, dehumidification becomes a bit more important. So perhaps your ERV won't be enough to uh, take care of the humidity in your house. So uh, standalone dehumidifiers may be useful or products like this uh, Minotaur at the bottom on the right um, where it's, uh, it uses a heat pump on the inside instead of a static core. So it actually uh, provides a little bit of heat. It provides ventilation first and foremost, but it also can provide a little bit of space heating, a little bit of space cooling, and most importantly, a lot of dehumidification. Um, now in an existing house, these units um, could be tied into your existing ductwork, but ultimately uh, the, the best case scenario that, well, there are three ways that you can install these. You can tie it into your existing ductwork, or you can uh, have the supply go into your existing ductwork and then you run exhaust ducts from your bathrooms and near your kitchen and all the wet rooms. So that eliminates all the bath fans and exhaust fans in your house. And you can use this ventilation system or fresh air system uh, as your primary ventilation system. Um, or ideally in the best case scenario, if you're basically starting from scratch or doing a huge renovation, all the ductwork would be independent, meaning that all the exhausts would go to the ventilation system and this ventilation system would supply fresh air to the bedrooms and the living rooms and, and places where you tend to hang out more. Uh, another key part when you're evaluating ventilation systems is that you want a high uh, efficiency rating or sensible recovery efficiency rating, 75% or higher is what you wanna look at. And you also wanna look at the wattage. So your EA can help you with this, uh, but essentially the lower the wattage, the, the less power you use as uh, as this machine is running. And really this the, these ventilation systems should be running 24 seven. So it's very important for it to be very efficient uh, and use very little power. 
once we look in uh, as the house is a sift system, we first look at the thermal enclosure and then we look at the upgrading the heating system. Now, you may be in the position where your furnace is going or you need to replace your um, uh, AC and so that might top that up into the priority list, but there are many things that you, you'll need to consider uh, depending on your situation. Uh, but ultimately when we, when an, your energy advisor runs the energy model, the HOT 2000 program can provide you with the heating and cooling loads, which are the size of the heating and cooling systems required to maintain comfort in your house. But then if you were to uh, upgrade your thermal enclosure with all the suggested upgrades in the report, now all of a sudden your heating and cooling loads are much, much smaller. So that's something that's critical to keep in mind uh, because that kind of gives you a range of where you are now and where your house could be. Uh, and if you um, upgrade your heating and cooling system now, it may be oversized if you end up doing the thermal enclosure upgrade. And you may think, well, it's fine if it's oversized because it'll help me keep warmer and cooler and more comfortable in the house. But unfortunately, the, the, the fact of the matter is that it, it, a heating system that's correctly sized will be running all the time, um, as opposed to an oversized system, which would short cycle, meaning that if it's, uh, it, it could blast a ton of air. Uh, so if the thermostat says, okay, it's time for some heat. And so the, the, the heating system blasts lots of air, heats up the thermostat really quickly and then shuts off. And then all of a sudden it cools down, but the room furthest from the furnace or the heating system doesn't get the to the correct temperature. So that sort of swing of temperature is uh, can actually lead to discomfort. Uh, and that's the problem with oversized systems. Um, and so that's why you want to size your system properly. And at the coldest temperature, it should be running all the time with heat pumps. And uh, a lot of the heat pumps will be uh, modulating, meaning that they'll be providing the right amount of heat at a given uh, time, which means that they're running almost all the time, but at the precise amount of uh, um, heat or uh, conditioning that's required for that house at that particular time. Now, there, there can be some oversizing of uh, heat pumps as well, so you just have to be careful, but the beauty of heat pump systems is that uh, you can have several different types of distribution systems, um, which automatically zones the house. So in a retro retrofit situation, uh, you can, uh, in the top right-hand corner, you can see that uh, there are different types of indoor heads, whether it's uh, uh, ceiling mounted or concealed or wall mounted, uh, and that automatically zones the the house so that that particular room with its own thermostat can maintain uh, comfort. And that's all from the same condenser that's on the outside. There are other systems where it's almost like a traditional furnace, uh, like this Stetson system here, um, where it has a distribution system just like normal, and you have an electric furnace as a backup. Um, now these cold climate air source heat pumps uh, rated down to minus 20, minus 25, and they continue working down to minus 30. So the idea that they're not appropriate for our climate is um, being proven more wrong as we, as we go along. The technology is getting much, much better. And the beauty of these air source heat pumps is uh, they're your AC uh, and they, they look like your air conditioner, uh, but in the summertime, in the wintertime, they run in reverse so they can provide heat. Uh, and, now those are air source heat pumps where they go from, uh, they take heat from the air and then they uh, put it into a refrigerant and then put it into an airstream inside the house. There's another, uh, there are other products out there like uh, people are very familiar with the ground source heat pumps or geothermal uh, heat pumps where they use the ground as a sink uh, and then they pull up that heat um, and put it into a, a heat pump within the house and then dis distribute it throughout the house. There's new technology coming out like these Arctic heat pumps where they're air to water heat pumps. So they look like normal air source heat pumps, but instead of putting it into an air distribution system, they put the heat or the, the, uh, the cool air, they can heat or cool into a buffer tank. And then from that buffer tank, it can distribute the 
space conditioning needs of the house in multiple ways. It can be either um, through an air handler and or uh, these uh, ductless mini splits and or uh, uh, in-floor radiant heating. So it allows you more flexibility, which could be really good in a retrofit situation. Uh, and because it goes through a buffer tank, it can't be oversized. So there are lots of pros and cons to that. Um, lots of reach research that, that is required to look into all these uh, different options as we move forward towards net zero. Now, another note here that is in this, uh, the upgrade is that with fireplaces, as you get tighter uh, and more, um, uh, you, you get your thermal enclosure more dialed in, uh, open fireplaces become a bit of a hazard, uh, a bit of a safety hazard. They'll depressurize the house a lot. That causes a lot of backdrafting. Now, if you're moving away from gas appliances, that's less of an issue. But if it's backdrafting and depressurizing the house, then it's really pulling in a lot of um, air from the outside through air leaks in your house, which you don't really want. Uh, so uh, the net zero approach, and this is from the Canadian Home Builders Association Net Zero Reno program, is to consider uh, putting in a, an insert, a fireplace insert that's uh, certified, EPA certified, uh, and a self-contained unit with its own fresh air duct. Uh, so it's a self-contained unit. Uh, or you may want to consider getting rid of the fireplace altogether. Food for thought. Now, we're, uh, with hot water, uh, once you take care of the thermal enclosure uh, and you move your heating and cooling systems to heat pumps, now uh, water, hot water tends to be the next biggest load. Uh, and if you're going from a natural gas or even an electric, a standard electric heater, uh, moving to a heat pump water heater, like the ones shown in this uh, in these pictures, is a, a great next step. So there are a few things to consider here. Uh, the first one here is this uh, this product, which is an integrated heat pump water heater, where it has the heat pump on top. It actually pulls heat from the room that it's in and dumps it very efficiently into the water uh, tank. And they're at efficiencies of 200 to 300% efficient, which is, uh, which is excellent from an energy perspective. That being said, uh, that cooling effect can be a bit of a, a negative. Um, so if you look at this one, it, it's ductable. Uh, so you can actually duct it. And depending on the configuration of your house, it can either go inside, outside. Um, you can get pretty creative with it. If you have a clear story, then you can duct it up as long as you have room for that duct. So you can pull warm air from uh, upstairs and then dump it back up there. And that could be something that you could do. Or if you go back to the Arctic, uh, the, the, first I'll say that the sand and water heater is a, uh, a newer sort of um, heat pump water heater where the condenser is on the outside and it uses CO2 refrigerants, which are very, very good from a global warming perspective and then heats up the water tank. Then you've got the Ar Arctic heat pumps. Now, I didn't mention this before, but these Arctic heat pumps, uh, not only can they uh, provide space heating and cooling, but they can also provide preheat for domestic hot water. So it can perform multiple duties. Um, so lots to consider about uh, hot water systems. And of course, I haven't uh, put it in here, um, but you could also consider installing a drain water heat recovery unit, which essentially uh, heats up the cold water that goes to a shower uh, as it's draining out. Uh, so that's something that you can look into. Then of course, once you've taken care of your whole house and you've dropped the loads down to around you know, 40 to 60 gigajoules per year, then you can start thinking about adding renewables. And we're typically talking about solar PV when we, uh, when we speak about renewables for a single house. Um, and uh, we always encourage uh, you to get quotes from solar contractors to see what's possible for your roof shape and the orientation. And of course, shading uh, plays a factor into this, uh, buildings and trees and all those kinds of things. So it's good to get the a professional out there. Um, and then the, to also know the limitations of solar. So of course in Ontario, there's a limit of a 10 kilowatt system on roofs. 
Um, but the interest, interesting thing is that there are uh, behind the meter technology that's available, like the solar, um, these inverters that allow you to use the power that is generated from the solar panels uh, directly when you're when it's being generated. So if the sun's shining, it can be linked to certain appliances like your fridge, or maybe in this case, a, a ductless mini split or certain key uh, appliances in your house. Uh, and then when the sun's not shining, then we pull from the grid. Uh, so this is uh, incredible technology because now all of a sudden during a power outage, your solar panels or certain solar panels will be able to act like a mini generator and have appliances running while the grid is down. So, uh, and then of course you can also add a little bit of batteries and then, uh, um, and that will provide power for the nighttime in case of a, a power outage. Uh, so lots of, uh, lots of cool stuff happening there. And of course you're not limited to uh, adding solar on the roof. And these two photos are from uh, our uh, member, um, SmartNet Alliance member Exacon Roofing and Solar. Uh, and you can see that you can either put it on the roof or in some cases, it might be appropriate to put the solar panels on the walls, which is great for uh, wintertime solar harvesting. And uh, I wanna finish off by saying that uh, plans are worthless, but planning is priceless as Winston Churchill said. Um, it's, uh, it goes back to the original quote of uh, time spent in reconnaissance is seldom wasted. Plans are great, uh, but essentially you wanna go uh, with the flow a little bit, especially with the renovation. You never know what's gonna come up and what situation you're in and, and which direction things will lead. Um, but what I will say, speaking of plans, is that one thing that you could do to help um, in your journey as you get started, um, is to reach out to the city of Ottawa and uh, they have access to your plans in, in their uh, archives. And you can actually get a digital copy of that, which you could send to your EA before they come out on site. And they can do a lot of the, um, a lot of the work that uh, Scott was saying, uh, those detailed measurements that you do on site can be done by the plans uh, with a little bit of reference from Google Street View which is uh, really, really convenient. Uh, and then when, the, when your EA still has to come out to take, you know, to verify everything uh, and to come in and look at the, your mechanicals and do the blow door test, uh, but then more time will be spent on uh, discussing your options and uh, helping you plan uh, how you can move forward and what your options are. Um, Another part of the big plan and, and reconnaissance is to get your team together. So, you know, energy advisors, uh, the, our service doesn't stop uh, once we provide you with the report. Obviously our, our goal is for you to take action as much as possible to get yourself to net zero. Uh, and that many questions will come up uh, along the way. So we are here to help and, uh, and answer your questions. Yeah, um, thanks so much, Stefan. And, and there were a couple of questions in chat. I want to save a little bit of time from Janice from the city to talk about the exciting Better Home Loans program. Uh, did you want to take a couple of questions now, if that's okay? And then we've got a couple that was just a sort of panel questions. Sure. Uh, so Nina's wondering, just on your last point there, once the upgrade report has been issued, can the homeowner contact the technician for any follow-up questions? Does the technician explain all aspects of the report? Uh, yes, so we we do uh, allow for some follow up time. Um, so once again, it depends on the uh, service organization or the EA, uh, but we we pride, our, pride ourselves in in being sort of your energy coach throughout your process. Uh, so within reason, uh, we'll we'll allow a little bit of back and forth, and then after that, we can you know discuss further consultation and our fees that are associated with that. Great, great, great. And uh, this is probably a bit of a hot button question, but um, um, Cam is wondering from the time somebody applies to go through an energy audit to the time it actually happens, how much time typically goes by? Um, I know it's probably a little bit different with, with COVID, but what's the, what's the window there? Yeah, so I, I believe the, um, uh, the intention is that once we are 
Uh, once a client chooses a service organization, we've got about five days to contact the homeowner and then it's, it's just down to scheduling and, and how it works. Uh, you know, typically we'll have a lot of EAs available, but uh, if, if you know, everyone on this call suddenly uh, calls EnviroCenter and HomeSol to do tests in the next month, well then that might be a little bit restrictive. So we work, out, uh, we work with our clients as much as possible to get it done as soon as possible. Great, great, great. Yeah, we hope to see a lot of people signing up for home energy audits. Justin's just wondering where at the city do we ask for those plans and specifically what do we ask for regarding that? Uh... I, I forget off the top of my head. I think it's like access to, it, might, it may even be access to plans. Janice might be able to give us a, a better answer for that, but it, it costs about $73. I actually did it for my house way back when I first bought my house about 10 years ago. Uh, and so I have the original plans from 1978. Now it's not exact, it's actually a flipped model uh, compared to mine, but all the measurements are basically there. And so if I wanted to get quotes from a siding contractor or windows, I could just send them those plans. And actually I, I, I made a uh, home hardware uh, building professional uh, very happy when I uh, sent him my plans because he had never seen that before. So it, it it's worth your $73. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks so much. And uh, I know we have a couple of questions for all the panelists. So we'll maybe circle back on that, uh, Michael and Chris. But I uh, want to thank Stefan so much for that great presentation. Really nice to to dive deep and to, to look at some of the mechanicals and, uh, you know, some, some great sayings there. And, uh, you know, that reminder to just breathe. And, uh, you know, that's a great one too. And, and take the step, step by step. And uh, looking forward to working with you and Home Soul a little bit more. And uh, stick around because we do have some questions for, for the whole panel there. So thanks so much. And just a reminder to stop share there if you can there, Stefan. Uh, so, so speaking of the city of Ottawa, we were happy to uh, kind of co-sponsor things with the city. I want to bring in Janice Ashworth to talk about the Better Home Loans program. So this is the city loan program. We don't have anyone specifically to talk about the NRCAN grant. So let's keep things as far as the questions to the actual city program. And uh, let's bring in Janice for a few words. After Janice, we'll hear from a few of our SmartNet Alliance members, and then we'll have a bit of time for the uh, follow-up questions to the panel. So come on in, Janice. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks, Nick. Glad to be here. Thanks for the presentations before this, too. They were all very informative, and I, uh, I learned some stuff from those presentations. Um, I'm just going to share the right screen here. Just looking for the right screen to share. Um, uh, I've got too many screens open. So as um, has been mentioned before, there's a couple of programs that are, oh, here it is, okay. A couple of programs that are on the horizon. So, and they're different names, but similar names. So Ottawa's prog program is called Better Homes Ottawa. Um, the federal program that was just announced today is called Greener Homes and it's a national program. So keeping those straight, um, I'm gonna speak a little bit about the Better Homes program. It's part of a broader context that, in, that Nick mentioned called energy evolution. The energy evolution strategy is the city's plan to achieving its greenhouse gas reduction targets, both the municipal infrastructure as well as the community as a whole. So you can see that plan um, available from this website that I'm sharing here. Um, this is the engageottawa.ca slash BHLP for Better Homes Loan Program. And on the right, you can find the link to the energy evolution strategy, which is many hundreds of pages, but talks about transportation, buildings, waste, natural, renewable natural gas, electricity, and, and everything in between. So lots of reading there. This is a component, this Better Homes Loan Program is a component of that broader energy evolution strategy, and it's really the residential retrofit component. So how, how can the city catalyze and support um, the retrofitting of, of residential buildings um, across the city uh, to make them more energy efficient? Um, so that this Better Homes program was approved in March of this year by the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, who approved a, a $12 million um, funding allotment, um, which is made up of a grant and a loan um, from FCM to the city of Ottawa to then channel that through or flow that through to um, homeowners in, in Ottawa. 
Um, the final program is expected to go to council. Um, well, we, we did some consultation on it on it now, April and May. And the final program is expected to go to council either July or possibly September, depending on um, if there's any delays caused by this latest announcement of the um, interest-free loans from the federal uh, CMHC um, offering. So, so that's throwing a little bit of a wrinkle in things because of the complication of of how we have how we deliver two types of loans that are very similar um, in the marketplace. But but in any case, we're hoping to launch the program in summer or uh, latest September um, if that if that federal program delays our, our release. I'm going to tell you a few things about the program and then I'm definitely open to answer questions. Um, so first you can you can take a look at this website yourself, but uh, but uh, pro uh, buildings that are eligible are are small residential, so um, single family homes, duplexes, townhomes, um, row houses. The anyone that would be eligible for an Energuide audit, um, or typically anyone that falls under Part Nine of the Building Code, the Ontario Building Code, is an eligible building under this program because it leverages the Enercan Energuide audit uh, process. So you have to first to be eligible for an energy audit through the Energuide program to be then eligible for this financing program. Um, it is stackable with the Green Homes uh, $5,000 rebate um, and stackable with other um, incentives from Enbridge or Hydro Ottawa or IESO or other um, types of incentives. Um, measure, measures that are eligible, I'll just click on this, <clears throat> on this link to start. You can see a list of them here, what we're considering, um, but basically thermal energy or thermal envelope upgrades, so insulation, uh, ventilation, uh, air barriers, air sealing, um, windows, doors, um, and, and, and related things that might include, you know, redoing drywall and, and painting if you have to remove drywall to add insulation, for example. Um, mechanical systems are also included, so thermostats, um, ERVs or HRVs, as was talked about, heat pumps, um, and, and duct sealing. What is not included in this mechanical systems list is, um, is gas furnaces. So we are excluding gas equipment or, or oil furnaces. Um, we are including electric heat pumps, um, hot water heating systems, solar hot water heating systems, um, water heaters, including electric water heaters or heat pump water heaters, drain water heat recovery systems, and then any, any sort of associated electrical equipment to like a service entry upgrade could also be eligible for the, for the financing program. It's also including solar PV or solar hot water, um, electric vehicle chargers or battery storage that's associated. Water efficiency is also included, like low flush toilets and shower heads. Um, we're also including health and safety measures that might include like asbestos removal required for some of these other things. Um, we're not including asbestos remo removal generally, but if it's required to do some of these other, you know, um, insulation projects, then it will be eligible. And then some climate ad adaptation measures like sump pumps, foundation waterproofing, um, we're also including this other, other component of additional dwellings. We really want to bring home the message that and support homeowners in adding additional secondary suites or rental suites. Um, and so we're, we're making eligible up to 30% of the loan value can be for adding an apartment um, to an existing heated space. So maybe it's a basement apartment or it's dividing off a portion of the home to have its own separate entrance. Um, so that's all also eligible under this program. And then lighting and controls and things like that. And the energy audit, if it's not covered under the federal program, um, the energy audit could be an eligible measure for financing as well. Um, so the financing package, the maximum amount can be 10% of the loan of the home value. Um, and the terms will be up to, there'll be a 20 year term is what we're looking at. This is what's being proposed. Um, 20 year fixed interest rate. Now we're not sure yet what the interest rate will be. I can't announce that. This, <laughs> specifically today, but I can say we're negotiating with FCM to try to match that 0% interest rate that the federal federal government has, has announced through CMHC. So this could be, at least for the first couple of years, a 0% interest, 20-year fixed term uh, loan proposition or proposal. Um, don't hold me to it, but that's what we're negotiating right now with FCM, and we're hopeful that that will be the case. Uh, it will be able to be to cover 100% of the costs that are borne by the homeowner, net of any incentives. So 
if there's incentives from Enbridge or the $5,000 incentive from the feds, this will cover the balance of the costs to the homeowner. Um, and that will be costs that are proven through things like receipts or invoices. Um, so that's that's kind of how we'll be, be looking at eligibility um, for costs. And then looking at eligibility requirements of participants. So I mentioned before, it's for small residential that's eligible for the Energuide audit. So that's detached or semi-detached town or townhomes. Can also include multi-unit res up to three stories or less. Um, must be within the city of Ottawa boundaries. The property must have a property tax account with the city of Ottawa, which is in good standing and has been for the past five years. Um, and we'll be doing some, some history checks on property property tax payments and, um, and water bill payments to verify eligibility. Um, if those are, have not been in good standing, there are other processes for confirming eligibility, but that is the first check we will be doing. Um, and then also the mortgage lender can, cannot, will not be, cannot, does not prohibit your involvement. So it will be up to you, the applicant, to confirm with your current mortgage lender that this is not um, ex excluded from their terms. Um, but that is on the homeowner to confirm. The application process will be uh, fairly straightforward. We're going to be working with Enviro Center on this, so it should be dovetailing well with your energy audit um, application as, and, and working through that same ener energy coach or energy auditor. Um, so there'll be an application, you, have, you must do a, a, an energy energy audit. So the Energuide audit is the first step. Um, the application to the city's program can go either before or after that energy audit, doesn't particularly matter. Um, then the homeowner selects contractors to complete the work um, and, and, and goes ahead with the retrofit. Once the work is complete, the post Energuide audit is carried out as per these other programs and the city will provide the balance of the loan at that point. So once the Energuide audit is complete, um, the measures are, are, are confirmed. Um, the balance of the loan can be forwarded. The one thing that I will say is that we are making a requirement, um, well, two things are a requirement for the program. One is that the, the work is $15,000 or more. So we're looking for things that are relatively deep retrofits or are not just single measures. Um, so $15,000 or more is the minimum um, that can be, can be requested from the city. Um, and there also must be air sealing uh, at, as one of the measures included. So um, we're looking for the improvements to be made in, in air tightness, as, as I, think they, I think it was Stefan who said this last, but the energy auditors explained, you know, that is the first step to ensuring a, a better home performance is, in, is improving your air ceiling. So we are going to be making that a requirement that the air ceiling be improved um, to the threshold that the energy Energide auditor uh, recommends. Um, as long as that's not more than three air exchanges per hour. And that's the that's the health and safety point at which an energy or some sort of HRV or ERV would be recommended. So for homes that are worse than three air exchanges per hour, we'll be looking to make that air sealing a requirement um, to improve that to the, to the threshold that the energy auditor recommends. Um, so once the Energuide audit post the follow-up audit proves that that's been met, um, then the balance of the loan can be directed to the homeowner. Um, the homeowner then pays the contractors and then over the 20 year term repays the loan via their property tax bill. So this is a loan that stays with the property. It's not on the individual, it's on the property. So if the property sells or transfers ownership in that time, that obligation to repay stays with the property. It's not on the individual's credit rating, it's on the property tax bill as, as a lien. Um, there will be an option to pay off the, the loan in bulk, one-time repayment with no penalty. Um, that's often done at the point of sale, but it could be done at any point. Um, and that can be uh, that can be the homeowners choosing at when they when they choose to do that within the 20 year term. Once the loan is paid off, then it's the lien is removed from the property and uh, and the property the tax certificate um, shows that. So that's the that's the gist of the program. Um, more details, of course, will be coming out when the when the report goes to council. Um, you can take a look at this website to see to look through what I've just what I've just um, presented. This is a live website, but uh, and you can also sign up right here, um, subscribe to the climate change e newsletter. That will give you a first notification of when the program is launched or or any updates that we're that we're launching or we're announcing. So that would be where I'd recommend you you, you subscribe to get uh, get the latest news on the program.
Fantastic, Janice. Thanks so much for, for a thorough review there. Exciting to hear about this new program. And we certainly hope that, uh, you know, homeowners kind of take that up and get excited about, uh, you know, hey, what's your ACH? And people can start comparing that and uh, getting that score lower, right? So fantastic. Um, thanks for all the work that you've done and Emma as well in the background in helping co-sponsor this. I did have uh, one uh, question from Michelle. She's saying, will the program apply to coach houses within the city of Ottawa? Yeah, so Michelle, thanks for that. If, if a coach house already exists, then yes, it will be eligible um, to, to receive energy improvements. Um, if your question is, can you use the program to finance adding a coach house? Um, I'm still discussing that with, that, that, that was a question that came up in the survey that we did. Um, and we're still discussing that with our, you know, internal stakeholders and, 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 uh, and planning team. Um, we were initially thinking that apartments or secondary suites would be subdivided from existing heated building space. Um, if we're going to be adding space, we might be looking at, if, if we want to finance, you know, the addition of space, we might be looking at allowing that in certain neighborhoods where intensification is being encouraged through the official plan. Um, and we might also be having a higher standard for um, greenhouse gas reductions. So we might say, yes, we'll finance that, but only if you achieve, you know, 50% reductions from your current heated space or something like that. So I, details still to be confirmed on that one. Um, it wasn't initially expected to be included, but um, but we, we, we see a benefit of, you know, additional intensification measures and, and perhaps this could be a way to, to do that. But keep in mind um, that the additional suites are only 30% of the total loan value. So you won't be able to build a whole new coach house with, you know, 30% of, of that, you know, 10% max of property value. So you'll need to find other financing as well for that, uh, for that coach house uh, um, capital cost. Oh, that's a good point. And Brian's wondering, uh, how many homes does the city hope to upgrade through this program? And how many does the city expect to reach net zero? Yeah, good question. Um, so I was modeling this at about $20,000 per home. And the financing we got from the from FCM will cover about 600 homes. Um, I've also set this up, however, to be recapitalized after we burn through that money from FCM, which I hope will be in the first year and a half. Um, I, I had modeled it over about three years, but I'm hoping that we'll be able to, to expedite that. And we're bringing on um, Van City Credit Union as a partner in the early days of the program um, to to find, do some of the financing and if if so if we if we work through all of the FCM funds we'll be hoping to recapitalize either with Van City or with other private financiers or city green bonds or or, or debentures um, to extend the program so so 600 is the is the initial estimate um, but then we expect to expand it beyond that once it's proven to be imminently successful. <laughs> Absolutely. And Aaron's just wondering, uh, what is the max value of the loan? You may have missed that. Yeah. So I, I mentioned this 10% of the property value um, is what we're, and that's the MPAC assessed, you know, the tax assessed property value is what we've set as the max. Um, we might set a cap the way that Toronto has as well, which is in Toronto at 75,000 is the max. Um, so again, that's an, that's an item that's gone out for, for, for consultation and we're deciding whether or not to set that 75K limit as the, uh, as the upper threshold. But keep in mind the minimum is 15,000. Oh, that's great. Uh, you know, great to hear. I know Chris weisflog has got a bit of a longer question. Maybe we'll circle back on that, Chris, and get you to unmute yourself. I do want to take a few minutes to introduce everybody to a couple of different SmartNet Alliance members. So Janice, if you don't mind hanging tight for, for another uh, question there, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll swing right back to you. So thanks so much for the hard work you're doing. And, uh, you know, great to see that the city's lining this up for, for everybody to get involved. And, uh, you know, we hope those first 600 homes just go like wildfire. Yeah, Chris, I mean, the short answer to Chris Weislot's question is just we're hoping to regulate that through the, through the high performance development standard. Um, so this program is really for retrofitting existing buildings and for the new stuff, we're hoping to do that through the high performance development standard. But, you know, happy to chat Chris offline for that. Yeah, thanks so much, Janice. Appreciate you uh, jumping in chat and seeing that question. Yeah, so thanks again. So uh, yeah, we've got about uh, 20 minutes left, everybody. So I want to go through uh, a couple of the different Smart and Alliance members. Uh, we work with our members here to, uh, most of them are kind of within the Ottawa area and, and around Canada. And we've got a few on the call right now. So I want to bring a couple in just to talk about their services. Uh, you know, a few of them are auditors, some of them are solar providers, uh, you know, renovators and home builders. So uh, why don't we roll through a few members? So let's start with Chris Habits, then we'll 
we'll roll over to, to Dan Vivian. And then we've got uh, Pete Basso from Demand Renewables to talk a bit about what you can do with solar. And then I know Sean from The Conscious Builder is on. So uh, Chris Habits, all of you should be able to unmute yourself since you're co-hosts. So uh, Chris Habits, over to you to just talk about good habits and, and what you're doing there. Thanks, Nick. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah, so I'm Chris Habits. I, I run my own engineering and energy auditing firm, Good Habits. Um, typically, I, I focused on the commercial world, but I am moving into the home energy audits, which is part of the reason I've been so active in the chat this evening, as I'm sure pretty much everybody has noticed uh, that I, I don't really shut up when I have a keyboard in front of me. Um, that being said, uh, yeah, you can reach out to me at chris at goodhabits.ca, habits spelt like my last name. And uh, yeah, I just appreciate all the, the activity in the chat tonight. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, thanks so much, Chris. Really appreciate you uh, jumping on a lot of those questions. Make sure that, uh, you know, you share a link to your website too, so people can check that out. I know you're a little bit more commercial services, but, uh, you know, then people can still support you. Dan Vivian from the Building Science Trust. Dan's also been great uh, with questions, and uh, he must have a bit of carpal tunnel syndrome as well there. Dan, come on in and tell us a little bit about what you're doing with the Building Science Trust. Uh, thank you very much, Nick, and I want to uh, thank all the presenters uh, tonight. It was very interesting, very hard to keep up with both the presenters and the and the chat at the same time. So um, uh, my business is a supplementary business. It's the Building Science Trust to the Energy Audit. It adds a, another level of information that uh, NRCAN Energy Audits don't have in it. So um, we add the costs. Um, NRCAN energy audits don't advise what the, the costs are to do the measures. We add what the annual utility savings would be. So the, the utility savings are identified in gigajoules, but we identify them in dollars. Uh, we convert the gigajoules from electricity, natural gas, or whatever the fuel is into dollars. We identify what the lifetime savings are in dollars, what the reduction in greenhouse gases are by measure. The NRCAN energy audit does it overall, but we identify the greenhouse gas reduction by measure. Um, we advise a year to make um, the measures. The NRCAN energy advisors don't necessarily advise the year um, and it doesn't make sense to do things like replace your windows when you just did it last year or <clears throat> even replace a natural gas furnace necessarily if it's 10 years old and it's still got 10 years to go in it um, and um, <clears throat> um, uh, and another couple reasons for that is there is undepreciated value in pieces of equipment and embedded energy in pieces of equipment. So the, the costs of the uh, undepreciated, and undepreciated value of equipment is generally a proxy for the embedded energy that's, that's remaining in, in the equipment. So that's the supplementary report that Building Science Trust uh, offers. We offer that supplementary report generally for $400 and um, we can do that across the country. That's great, Dan. Really important uh, report for people to have. So once you've got your audit and you want to know, you know, hey, how can I go a little bit further? What are some of the hacks? Dan's a great person to talk to. He's got them all. He's done them all. So make sure you head over to his website, the Building Science Trust. I'm sure Dan will put a link in there as well. And uh, thanks so much, Dan, for being so active in chat. We've also, so once you've got your, your audit and you've got the next steps from Dan, we hope that you go solar as well. So let's bring in Pete uh, Basso from Demand Renewables just to say a little word about uh, how they can help you on the solar front. Yeah, thank you very much, Nick. Um, hope everyone can hear me and thank you everyone for the great presentation tonight. Well done. Um, I wanted to touch on a couple of points. Um, we'll just briefly, Demand Renewables is a renewable energy company. So we, uh, uh, we do um, commercial and residential photovoltaic installations. Um, so exactly kind of what we're talking about uh, tonight, kind of um, you know, allowing you to generate your own uh, energy on site, which I think is a really important point. Um, we're also uh, sticking to the um, energy audits kind of uh, discussion 
Um, we are um, getting members of the organization uh, Entercan certified at this point. So it's um, really to kind of bring that understanding into our group and um, do some of those audits as well moving forward and really to, to kind of put a whole holistic um, understanding to the, uh, to the uh, you know, to that part of um, the process and what we can, uh, we can offer as an organization. Um, I wanted to touch real quickly on a couple of things that were uh, brought up tonight, um, specifically in um, Stefan's presentation with some of the things that Floral Takes can do. So it's not only just obviously the conversion of the DC energy from the sun into AC for your home. You mentioned there are some things that can, um, some sort of add-ons and things that can be, uh, that can be used for. And the technology that we uh, primarily install you can actually um, use photovoltaics to um, it's to use something called a solar boost uh, to uh, help charge your electrical vehicle. So uh, the company we use also has an EV charger. And again, when the sun's shining, you can use something called solar boost to boost that charge. That's something that's neat. And then there are a number of other uh, things in the home that can be done. Uh, one of the other things that wasn't mentioned was like a hot water uh, heater as well. And there's some other things that you can do with that uh, additional solar energy. Um, and of course, um, you know, integrate uh, a battery system in um, should uh, the power go out, uh, your solar will in fact be still operational and charging the batteries and using the battery power as, uh, as things go on. So the things that, uh, you know, all the things that we offer, and I think it is really important to use a reputable group um, to do a, a really detailed analysis for you so that you're getting not only the best system installed, but the best value. So it's something that I think we, uh, we focus on as an organization and um, we're very excited to be working um, with uh, residents of uh, that area as long as, uh, as well as the, uh, the greater Toronto area and really all of Canada at this point. So anyways, thanks, Nick. And thanks, yeah, thanks so much, Pete. Really appreciate the work that you and Phil are doing over there at Demand and as a part of the Alliance. I did share your, uh, your website. Someone else was asking for your info. So maybe just put your email again into chat, but I did share your uh, a clickable link to the Demand Renewables. So thanks so much. We've also got Sean on the call from the Conscious Builder. So uh, talking about building and renovating. Sean, did you want to just uh, come on in and, and say a couple words about the Conscious Builder? Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, so... My, well, again, my name is Sean Patterson, Director of Client Success at The Conscious Builder. Um, it's great to be here with you all. So many great and very informative presentations. I'd really like to thank you, Nick, uh, for inviting me in to speak uh, about our company at this great event. Uh, so just a little high level on um, you know, what we're all about. The Conscious Builder, owned by uh, owned and founded by Casey Gray. It's all about educating our clients, helping them make truly conscious decisions when thinking about their new builds or uh, rental retrofits, um, and being aware of how every decision, every action will, uh, will have a real impact. Um, moving on a little bit to, you know, our business and the model and so on, what we're all about. Uh, we're a premier custom builder, renovator uh, that are carry on and rental mark certified. For more than 10 years, we've successfully completed numerous residential projects uh, in and around the, the Ottawa market. Uh, so for all of our projects, just to give you a little more insight, uh, we have instituted a comprehensive multi-phase construction process, which ensures uh, for well-organized, smooth project. Um, as a very important component of this, we have our integrated design process, uh, where we work closely with our clients, our network of very talented, knowledgeable architects, uh, as well as uh, energy advisors, such as the great Stefan Magnarin. <laughs> uh, great majority of unique projects range from uh, R2000 homes, net zero, net zero ready, uh, all the way up to your certified passive builds. Um, so that, that being said, our primary goal, primary goal and focus is centered around um, essentially ensuring that our clients uh, whether it be for a custom home or energy uh, rental retrofit, uh, can enjoy a healthy, efficient, and quality space. On the other side of the business, uh, we're uh, committed to educating as many uh, people as we can on how to better build and live a more conscious life. Uh, this is achieved uh, through connecting um, the various platforms such as uh, the Conscious Builder, YouTube channel, blog posts, LinkedIn, and now the newly established concert, uh, Conscious Builder Academy. 
Um, so I will throw in all the uh, the links in the chat box. Uh, and again, if anybody has any further questions, comments, please feel free to uh, reach out to me directly. Yeah, thanks so much, Sean. And I did put the uh, the link for the website, so maybe uh, yeah, add your YouTube and uh, and all that uh, all that other stuff. So thanks so much for all the work that you guys are doing, and uh, great to see and uh, support uh, Casey and the whole team over there. So thanks again. Also wanted to highlight a couple other members who had to drop off the call. Thank you very much. Uh, Cheers. Thanks, Sean. Uh, we had Darren from Lagois who was helping out with the chat. So we did put uh, their uh, their link in there. And we also had uh, Roderick uh, Costain, who's going to be at our uh, Green Drinks June in a couple weeks. And they're Rocco Industries. So if you're looking for innovative new product, they've got a solar siding product that's just in the pilot phase right now. So worth checking out uh, as a potential around uh, upgrading your home. So we've got a couple more minutes for some general questions. I did have a couple come through chat. For, for sort of everyone. Uh, so Chris Weisfog says, question for any of the three presenters. Will the energy advisor who visits the house and does the report recommend specific assemblies and specific materials for the envelope detailing air barriers, vapor control layers, thermal barriers to ensure the outcome is uh, hy hydrothermally sound? Are all energy advisors trained or equipped sufficiently well to offer this level of information? Maybe Scott or Stefan maybe wants to jump on that. Yeah, then, sorry, <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in there uh, and hand over to Stefan because I'm sure he's got some, some uh, good good information to share as well. So, um, to various degrees, I guess would be the 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 answer. Uh, yes, most energy advisors are, are well qualified in in um, in all elements of building science and understand fully the, the building envelope and the requirements to sort of balance. Um, the, the thermal profiles with the home, with the air barriers, and, and keeping in mind uh, the way moisture is migrating through the, the building as well. So um, it really depends on the house. So every house is going to have a different uh, approach, a, a different set of conditions, and a different set of potential challenges. So um, if an energy advisor is unable or unqualified to, to make and present some good opportunities and strategies with particular building materials or, or building systems or approaches, uh, then they would be recommending uh, speaking with qualified contractors in the field. Um, at least that's that's our approach. Yeah, I echo Scott's, uh, Scott's advice there. Um, I mean, the report will have links uh, and one of the links is keeping the heat in, which is a great, uh, um, online resource for the building enclosure and so that could be a good way to, to self-educate as a homeowner uh, but ultimately uh, you know there were some prices for how much an energy audit costs and uh, um, that varies a lot but good energy advisors with uh, you know good building science exper uh, experience will take a lot more time to to help and to coach uh, and even uh, a good renovator like the conscious builder, they still use uh, home soul as a coach essentially, um, bounce ideas off us and, and it's an ongoing partnership. Um, so, you know, the report won't because as Scott mentioned, there could be so many different variables and it all comes down to the materials of choice, the costs and all these other variables that is difficult to define. Oh, that's great. Uh, Michael's wondering, uh, have any of you encountered a home that is near ideal according to your standards? Uh, would it be correct for me to think that the more simple the design of a house, the better? And thanks to Michael for that question. Uh, simple is good. Simple is always good. It, it makes everything easier. Um, but ideal, uh, you know, once again, there are too many variables and it depends on your ultimate goals. Yeah, good point. Uh, Daniel's wondering, if we've signed up with NRCAN Greener Homes Grant, do we contact the provider we selected or do they refer the contact us? Maybe we, maybe it's too new. So does anybody know about that? Yeah. Um, so far, what we know is that uh, homeowners will be required to register themselves on the, uh, the Natural Resources Canada portal that's been developed uh, to, to manage uh, inquiries and direct um, requests for assessment. So a homeowner will register themselves. They will select a service organization on that 
Intercan portal. And uh, at that point, Natural Resources Canada would send an email out to the uh, associated service organization who would then schedule it with an energy advisor. So bit of, quite a different approach than, than we've seen in, in other programs, although it is an approach that I think has taken uh, place in, in Quebec um, at the very least. Uh, I'm not sure about other programs in, in Canada, but um, certainly it's a little bit of a different approach that we're used to here. Yeah, thanks so much, Scott. Appreciate that. Uh, Chris Habits is just wondering, does anybody, is there a single resource out there for all the re rebate programs? I know Janice is highlighting and, and we're helping to work on the uh, the rollout of the betterhomesottawa.ca, but that's not quite there yet. Anything else that uh, people recommend? Maybe something that Marcus knows as far as a portal with all the rebates in one. I know there's the Better Homes Toronto, um, but uh, yeah, Marcus, did you want to jump in on that one? Uh, there's nothing that I can think of off my head. Uh, there was a website that I came across maybe two, three weeks ago. I don't remember the actual site itself, but it had uh, quite a bit of information uh, based on province and area, but nothing that is like succinct for the entire province or the entire area. It just had you know, some general areas. I think I'd like, I can add, I mean, most, most service organizations, I believe, um, will do do their due diligence to make sure that they're able to sort of satisfy client questions uh, regarding different programs. Um, and Buyer Center certainly does try and try and keep abreast of all the opportunities because if uh, if we're not able to satisfy, um, you know, with one particular service, there may be another service out there. So we, we do try and um, make sure that we're uh, at least knowledgeable of uh, the majority of kind of rebate programs and, and energy upgrade programs. Um, but I think that's what I understand as well about the Better Homes loan or the Better Homes Ottawa website is that it's it's really for at least Ottawa residents going to going to act as that one uh, catch all for all programs and options. Yeah, absolutely, Scott. And uh, this one might be uh, one for you as well. Ismail is wondering in the Edbridge website, there's a list of auditors to contact. Does that mean that Edbridge only accepts their reports only? As far as the Enbridge program. Um, so the Enbridge program also leverages the this, this same EnerGuide program that's a natural resources program. So um, when you go on to a, an Enbridge website, you will be finding uh, service organizations who are EnerCan service organizations who are also licensed with or registered with Enbridge to provide uh, both the EnerGuide rating system energy assessments as well as um, assisting homeowners with the Enbridge Home Efficiency Rebate Program processes and, and applications. Thanks so much, Scott. Well, uh, if everybody can believe it, I think we've run through all the questions, which is quite a feat because uh, the chat's probably a couple of miles long. So uh, thanks so much, everybody, especially thanks to some of our members, Dan and, uh, and Chris, for the help in chat. Uh, why don't we go around for some final words? Marcus, did you want to say a couple of final words? Uh, a big thank you for your presentation. Uh, this has been very exciting and, you know, most of all, we're excited to see everything happening in the industry. It's finally come to a point where, you know, you can see things happening, they're rolling out. And the next coming years is going to be, uh, you know, it's going to be a great place and uh, it's going to be very uh, exciting, essentially, to see how the entire thing takes shape and, and what new changes are coming as well, along with the research that is out there, the new products that are coming out. It really is, uh, you know, essentially the future. So glad to see it, glad to be a part of it. Yeah, no, thanks so much for being a part of it, Marcus. Uh, I know we connected for the, uh, the Toronto Hero one, and it was great that you could come and, and lend your expertise. So thanks again. Scott uh, from Enviro Center, it looks like you've got your work cut out for you for the next, uh, what, decade. Uh, a few final words on uh, what you're going to be up to with Enviro Center. Yeah, I, I was just, I was trying to prepare for <laughs> the final preparations for this presentation. Am I? My email was just exploding today after about one o'clock. It was just just a flurry of, of inquiry. <laughs> so yes, it's going to be a, a pretty crazy uh, coming couple months too, especially as we're trying to actually figure out uh, the system because um, it has yet yet to be developed. The, the interest is there and the demand's there, but uh, we're still waiting for the guide. Um, so it's coming though, uh, and it is exciting. And yeah, I want to thank uh, Smart Net Alliance very much for having me on board. Uh, it was great to see how much support and, and interest there is in, in energy assessments and the industry in general. 
and also great to sort of get on a panel with um, with folks like Marcus and Stefan. Um, Stefan and I work in the same field in the same city and and don't really get to connect as, as much as maybe we, we should or could. So uh, it was nice to be on the same panel. Thanks. Yeah, thanks so much, Scott. Really appreciate that. And nice to have Enviro Center as one of our uh, affiliate members and uh, great work that you're doing and look forward to staying connected to that. And uh, Stefan, I know we're going to have a big announcement next month about uh, bringing HomeSol into as a member of the SmartNet Alliance. So welcome to the Alliance and uh, some final words for everybody. Uh, thank you. I'm looking forward to uh, being a, a member of SmartNet Alliance and, and thank you for the opportunity for me to speak about, uh, you know, at, what we do and how we can help homeowners take action. Yeah, absolutely. And invite everybody to, to check out HomeSoul and, and some of the important work you're doing. And uh, yeah, thanks again for a great presentation. Janice from the city, uh, we're going to be looking forward to, to more information and more partnerships. A few final words uh, on, on what to expect for the rollout there. Um, just that if you do have feedback, you're welcome to contact us and, and suggest, you know, updates or changes to the program. We're still in the final design phase, so now is the time to be heard. Um, and yeah, do, do keep in mind that if you would like to leverage the $5,000 and go deeper, that the financing will be available for you um, to do that. So keep that in mind as you're making your plans. Yeah, absolutely. And, and thanks so much again to you and Emma for, for all the great work from the city. Uh, yeah, so so that's about it. I think we wrapped it up by nine o'clock, everybody. I want to thank the SmartNet Alliance members for jumping on as well. I want to remind you that we're back in a couple weeks. So uh, if you're still looking to get uh, some more webinars, we're back with our virtual green drinks in June. And that's going to happen on uh, June 10th in two weeks time. We're going to have a couple of our members out to talk about solar. So make sure you sign up for that one because spaces do tend to fly pretty quickly. Uh, I'll stay on the line a little bit for people who want to uh, uh, record the chat. Remember, it's the three buttons there beside the file, so you can save the chat. A lot of good stuff there. I uh, want to thank everybody once again. Um, you know, great session. It's great to see this movement, and, uh, you know, we hope that uh, you have a little bit more information now, and that, uh, you know, especially with uh, with the grant being announced today and the, and the loan program soon to follow, we certainly hope that uh, you sign up for, for an audit, and that, uh, you know, once you get that done, you take a look at our member page and you support some of the work that our members are doing and you really uh, enlist yourself in this uh, battle against climate change right and uh, you know for all the people who are wondering hey what can I do I think that audit is a great start so once again thanks everybody uh, this is Nick from SmartNet Alliance and we'll see you again soon.